There's a rumor going around. If you like this video and subscribe you will unlock the half hot half cold quirk. Hi guys this is the next part of. What if Itachi Uchiha was reincarnated in the world of fairy tale. I hope you enjoy. The bright light of a lantern shined down an underground stairway. The echoes of footsteps could be heard clear as day, down this long dark stairway. Two figures walked down this dark stairway, up front carrying the lantern was Mest formerly known as Dorenbolt of the Rune Knights. And behind him, was Fairy Tale's newest guild master, Itachi Uchiha. Itachi inspected the stone brick walls, noting that the stairway itself was rather old. Noticing material, they used to have at the very first guild hall before it was destroyed by Phantom Lord. I never knew such a place existed beneath the guild, even with my Sharingan I never noticed it. Master Makarov purposely designed it for such. He didn't want anyone but those who have held the rank of master knowing of this place. Once you joined the guild, and he learned how your Sharingan worked. Makarov placed special seals around the entrance so you wouldn't notice. Mest replied, and indeed, Itachi noticed the magic circles Makarov had placed around the entrance when Mest first showed it to him. The only reason I know of this place, is because Makarov told me about it. In case the worst would come to pass, and, since I am now the seventh guild master, I have earned the right to know what is hidden down here. Itachi already had a pretty good idea what it was. Something Makarov's own son Ivan so longingly searched for, the Lumen he stwar. Correct, this place is for your eyes only. Makarov even instructed me to erase my own memories after I have showed this to you. I sealed my memories away the first time he showed it to me, so I only remembered he showed me some secret. A secret I would only remember upon fairy tales resurrection. That way, no one could force me to reveal anything if they found out Makarov had showed it to me. Itachi had faint memories of Mest resurfacing, memories of his presence in the guild before Lucy joined. The reason for the whole Dorenbolt identity, was that a special mission given to you by Makarov. Itachi questioned, and was met with a mere silence. Mest eventually broke the silence with a light chuckle. Figures you would find out, I will explain more later. But for now, here we are, Mest stopped before a massive green door. The door itself was decorated with golden lines shaped like that of a forest with what looked like fairies flying around. Whatever was hidden behind that door, Itachi could see the rich amount of Ethernano coming from it. The Ethernano was so thick that it looked like fairies themselves flying around this big empty space. Fairy tale's greatest secret of all, Lumen Histoire. Messed without further ado opened the door. Itachi looked taken aback, as it was like an explosion of Ethernano particles blew up in his face. Itachi hesitantly took a step inside, walking over a stone bridge to reach the center of the room. The first, Itachi was at a loss for words, towering over him was a giant crystal. And inside that crystal, was the naked body of the first fairy tale master, Mavis Vermilion. His attention averted from the body of the first master, to the sudden ruckus coming tumbling in from the door. Idiot, quit pushing. Both Itachi and Mess turned around and spotted Natsu falling out followed by Lucy, Gray, Urza, Wendy, Happy and Carla. Ouch, why the hell didn't you stop pushing Flamebrain? Gray latched his hand onto Natsu's scarf, both glaring at each other. I didn't push, you did you popsicle. Natsu threw back and the two began to rumble. Seize this at once you pair of fools. Urza scolded them, pushing them by the neck face down into the dirt. Gee guys, Lucy stuttered as she shakingly pointed up, diverting everyone's attention. And they all froze and gaped at what they saw, Itachi giving them a harsh cold look with his Sharingan glowing in the dark making him look all the more menacing. F forgive us, Urza forcefully made Natsu and Grey bow with her. You guys, what do you take me for? Itachi looked down on them with a raised brow at their reaction. Not realizing that the lighting in this dark room, and his red glowing Sharingan made him look angry. And after I spent all the time explaining to them why only the guild master is allowed in here. Mest sighed and merely shrugged his shoulders, guessing he would have to erase their memories as well. This ain't fair, let us in on it too. Natsu shouted in outrage. Wh what the heck is that? Gray's attention was averted upon sensing this intense amount of Ethernano coming from that crystal. And only further looked in shock along with everyone else as they noticed Maviz's body inside of it. It's, the first, isn't it? Wendy questioned, looking in awe at feeling all this Ethernano filling the air and she's buck naked, Natsu gawked, to which Lucy covered his eyes. No peeking, Lucy blushed a bit as she pulled Natsu back a bit. Is she alive in there? Happy questioned, 
But why is she here? And what is that so-called ghost we've been seeing all this time? Carla questioned, as they all recall seeing the ghost of their guild's first master multiple times. What is this? Urza looked to Itachi and messed for answers. This is Fairy Tail's biggest secret. The one Raven Tail was after during the Grand Magic Games, and the one Makarov threatened to use during the Tartaros incident. This, is the Lumen he swore. Itachi informed them on what he had been briefed on so far. Itachi. Mest looked shocked that Itachi would reveal this information. It doesn't matter anymore, if this is a part of the reason Makarov has been missing. Then there is no reason to keep it a secret any longer. I'm sure the first agrees with me. Itachi looked at the crystal with Mavis behind him from the corner of his eye. Please, continue Mest. Mest groaned a bit, as this meant he disobeyed Makarov's orders. But Itachi was the current guild master, so Mest guessed he had no choice. Even I don't really know the exact nature of the Lumen Histoire. But one thing is clear, she is showing faint signs of essential vitals. Meaning she is alive in there. Then I'm guessing the ghost we've been seeing, is a mere projection created from the first's magic power. Itachi looked over Mavis' body with his Sharingan, magic was endlessly pumping through her very veins. Her entire body in his eyes looked like a glowing ball of pure magic power. More importantly get to the part about Gramps. Where is he? Natsu shifted the subject, looking impatient. More importantly he says, Lucy sweat drops at Natsu's wording. Very well, I will show you my memories. Mest using his magic pushed his memories into the minds of everyone in the room. How Makarov had him infiltrate the magic council and gather intel on the western continent. And how Mest came up with the idea to erase his own memories, and give Makarov the key to unlock them again. And how Mest adopted the identity of Dorenbolt, a commanding officer amongst the rune knights. And how Makarov would occasionally visit Dorenbolt, and revert him back to Mest to gather the intel he had recovered. And then it showed how Dorenbolt came up with the idea to take down Fairy Tail by infiltrating them in the S-Class trails eight years ago. The fuck man, both Natsu and Grace sent Mest a look. I am truly sorry about that, Mest sweat dropped and continued showing his memories. Skipping to the Grand Magic Games last year, and how the tearful reunion of Mest and Makarov took place. And how Mest had obtained the intel Makarov desired while they were sealed away on Tenro Island. Then it skipped to the aftermath of Tartaros. Makarov watched as Mira Jane and Urza carried Itachi's unconscious body to the medical bay after the beating he took from Madara. Then it showed how Makarov unlocked Mest's memories of him being a part of Fairy Tail. Then Makarov came with a shocking declaration. The time has come to disband Fairy Tail. E-H-H. Mest looked confused. Through the information you have gathered for me all these years on the Western continent. And all of my own research on them, one thing has become clear today. That this, is the only way to protect the guild and my children. You are breaking the guild up based on some intel. That doesn't make any sense. Mest looked outraged and Makarov calmed him down with a single look. You don't have to comprehend my decision. There is a major power within the western continent, a country known as the Alvarez Empire. That country is just far too dangerous. Makarov revealed the name of their newest foe. And why does that matter? Sure, ten years ago they attempted to attack Ishgar, but they failed. Mest pointed out. Do you know why they attempted an invasion in the first place? Makarov asked, and Mest merely shook his head. The Lumen Histoire. Ten years ago, Alvarez's sole purpose for invading Ishgar was in order to obtain the Lumen Histoire. Their invasion didn't fail, but was stopped. The council made use of their secret weapon, the Ethereum. And in light of the faces thanks to resent events, they most likely threatened Alvarez with them as well. That's why they stopped the invasion. But now, both weapons have been neutralized, with the death of the Magic Council. Mest uttered, balling his hands into fists at the memory of Jackal killing the Magic Council members along with Lahar. I have no doubt that due to this, they will attempt a second invasion. But why disband? Fairy Tail has overcome many challenges before, they will be no different. Including Fairy Tail, there exists about 500 guilds within Ishgar, and not all are magic guilds. Whereas Alvarez Empire, is made up of 730 mage guilds. Both light and dark guilds. Those 730 magic guilds, are united into one massive gigantic empire. They are essentially a super military. To this revelation Mest began sweating bullets out of fear. Not to mention, today, I learned a second player is after the Lumen Histoire. Someone even our strongest member was hopeless against. 
Madara Uchiha, he possesses powers that make him look like a god in comparison to us. If Madara and the Alvarez Empire are both gunning for the Lumen Histoire, Fairy Tail would be wiped out in under a day. Honestly, I don't know who I fear more, an entire country made up of magic guilds, or that monster. Makarov quivered at the memory of his confrontation with Madara. He was helpless to do anything against him. And no way, there must be something we can do. Mest looked utterly horrified. I shall go and negotiate with the Alvarez Empire. I'm going to put all my cards on the table, and show them that if they invade Ishgar, I will use the Lumen Histoire. All I can do is try and buy us some time. I'm betting everything on this. During that time, if we can just rebuild the council and get back the Ethereum. W wait a second, what about Madara? Mest questioned, as he couldn't see how this removed Madara from the equation. A demonic god or not, he is but one man. I have faith in my children, that if he comes to attack, they can combine their strength and take him down. Itachi even showed us how much power is hiding within him. If we're up against only Madara, we might have a chance. Makarov sighed as he looked up to the starry night sky. Forgive me, Itachi, for entrusting you with such a difficult task. Master, wait, if worst comes to pass, and something should happen to me and the guild is left behind. Then they are going to come after those kids. Makarov balled his hands into fists, his eyes burning with a fiery determination and fatherly instinct. That is the one thing I can simply not allow to happen. The guild's history, legacy, all of it be damned. If it means protecting my family, then I will disband fairy tale without a moment of hesitation. Master, it's just too much for a single human to try and stop an entire country, you make it sound like you're going off to die, Mest begins to weep. I'm proudly carrying the lives of my family on my back. That's what it means to be a parent. And thus, Mest's memories came to an end. Everyone stood in silence, letting this new knowledge sink in. That Makarov disbanded the guild for their sake. Itachi unlike the rest, who were thinking about Makarov's safety, was already conducting a strategy to take on this empire. It was like he was playing chess or shogi inside his mind, trying to add up their forces against the Alvarez empires. Chances of victory, 43%. Chances of zero casualties, 0%. Without a doubt, if we go to war, people will die, and in large numbers, chances of Madara getting involved, 90%. Itachi clicked his tongue in frustration, even resulting to biting his fingernail. If possible, we must avoid conflict, although chances of that is nearly zero as well. You haven't heard from Makarov since. Gray in the meantime was questioning Mest. Correct. You didn't try to stop him. Happy questioned sadly. You really think Mest could have stopped someone as headstrong as Master Makarov? There was probably little to nothing he could do. Carla answered. I hope he's okay. Lucy and Wendy both looked concerned. Is he still in the midst of negotiations? Has he been captured? Or could it be that? Don't finish that thought. Urza interrupted and everyone was left in an awkward silence once more. I worked in accordance to Makarov's plans, to resurrect the Magic Council. With the help of Warad Sama, we've formed a new Magic Council around the Ten Wizard Saints, of course excluding Makarov himself. Warad Sama is aware of the situation, and the Lumen Histoire, although he doesn't know that it is the body of the first. Seeing as it could cause some complications, but, the other council members are unaware of the situation regarding Makarov and the Lumen Histoire. They all however recognize the threat the Alvarez Empire poses. But, then it means Master was successful. And should be returning home any minute now. Gray pointed out. Ideally yes, we can only assume he has been made unaware of these developments. Or his circumstances are preventing him from returning. Mest revealed. Either way, we're going to save his ass. Right, Natsu boldly declared, his passion burning intently with his aura. Wait, Itachi halted Natsu from making another move and everyone looked caught off guard. The threat this empire poses is not to be taken lightly. And for now, we shouldn't make any rash moves. So we're just going to leave Gramps at that empire. Natsu questioned in outrage, getting up into Itachi's face about it. It's been a year, we're all stronger now, we can take this empire down no problem. Itachi in response shot Natsu a glare that made the dragon slayer back down. I have a wedding to plan. Not to mention a guild to rebuild from scratch. If the Alvarez forces haven't invaded, it is safe to say Makarov has managed to keep the negotiations going. Which means we have time to spare. As master, I order all of you to focus on the rebuilding and construction of the guild hall. 
If you should fail to comply with my order, I will personally deal out a suitable punishment. Is that clear? Itachi intensifies his glare at Natsu, although Natsu still doesn't back down and looks displeased. Mest puts his hand onto Itachi's right shoulder, and looks him in the eye. But what about Makarov? We don't exactly know how long we got to rescue him. My informants at the border of the Alvarez Empire haven't gotten that much intel yet. Itachi in response brushes Mest's hand gently off his shoulder. Lucy, Wendy, Gray, Urza and Natsu all look at Itachi with a rather nervous look. Thinking Itachi came off as too harsh right now. This nervous feeling however, was brought to a close at Itachi's next words. I never said we weren't going after Makarov. However, we can only afford to send a small rescue part of four. If we get caught up in any form of battle, we will compromise our nation's already rocky relationship with the western continent. To avoid that, I will handpick four people for this assignment. Itachi declares. I will go. Natsu instantly volunteers for this task. Although Itachi shots him a glare of denial. No, sorry Natsu, but you are not the stealthy type. Natsu looks hurt at that comment, even though it was true he still wanted to rescue Makarov. Itachi then looked over to Urza. Urza, you and Mira Jane shall govern as master until I return. I shall personally go for this assignment. Itachi declared, and no one could seem to argue. When it came to stealth, someone with the background of an S-ranked shinobi like Itachi was the obvious choice. Mest, you will accompany me on the rescue party. Your teleportation and mind manipulation will come in handy for this. Lucy, you will also come along. Your spirits might come in handy, particular Virgo should we need to make a quick exit. Ah, come on, Natsu roared with frustration. If Lucy's going, I'm going. Someone's gotta protect her. Upon hearing Natsu's declaration Itachi cracked a smile, and Lucy blushed a bit. Quite the interesting declaration, Natsu. Although, you are too loud and too much of a wild card for this assignment. But worry not, I have a different task for you. One I think you might like. Upon hearing this Natsu tilts his head in anticipation. I want you, Gajil, Grey and Kana to find our missing members. Laxus and the Thunder God tribe. Oh, and feel free to challenge Laxus if you want to test your powers against him. If you beat Laxus, I will even take you on when you return. Atachi's offer made Natsu brighten up like a kid on Christmas morning. Alright, let's do this, Happy. Natsu roars, I sir. Happy high fives Natsu with his tiny little paw, and then they storm out. H hey wait. Grey shouts and rushes after them to gather Kana and Gajil. Surely those two wouldn't refuse either, Gajil like Natsu wouldn't want to miss a chance to fight Laxus. And Kana, well she has known Laxus the longest out of all of them. Are you sure about this? Mira might get angry at you for skipping out on the wedding plans. I can go in your stead after Makarov, Urza offered. No, it's fine, conflict will most likely rise from this anyway. And people will die as a result, people we care about. So, Mira and I might need to rush our wedding up a bit. Itachi knew that members of their guild would most likely end up dying. Heck, even here Mira Jane could end up dying. He wanted to get married to Mira Jane as soon as possible. Besides, I want Master Makarov to be there. I'm sure Mira Jane feels the same. Urza's expression softens up, as she smiles warmly at Itachi, her brother. Lucy and Wendy both also warmly smiles upon hearing this. Makarov was like their father after all, he should be present at the wedding. I see, very well. I shall guide our comrades in the reconstruction of the guildhall. Urza proudly bumped her fist to her armor's chest. It will be up and standing before you return with Makarov. Master, Urza salutes Itachi as the new master of fairy tale. Thank you, Urza. Itachi returns the salute and smiles. Then he looks over to Lucy. Lucy, go and find Levi. She is the last one to be a part of our rescue team. Yes, Master. Lucy smiles and together with Wendy and Carla run out to find the final member of their party. Everything seems to be taken care of. Urza lets out a sigh of relief. Not quite, I need someone to go and deliver the documents of Fairy Tales Resurrection to the Council. That was the last thing they needed taken care of. No problem, I will go. Mira can handle the guild while I'm gone. Urza, without hesitation took the task. Having gotten the papers from Levi before she left with Itachi, Mest and Lucy. Urza headed off to the Magic Council to deliver the documents. When she arrived, she handed the documents over to her good friend, Jura. 
Hmm, yes these documents don't seem to be lacking anything, as expected of Levi Dono. Itachi Dono for Guild Master I see. A splendid choice. Jura looked pleased on hearing the news of Fairy Tales revival. Indeed, Oni-san has always been Mikarov's favorite choice for future Guild Master anyway. Urza nodded in agreement to Jura's words. Yes, I hope you all manage to find Makarov Dono soon. Jura looked around at his fellow wizard saints and council members. I'm sure you're happy about Fairy Tales revival as well, Warad Sama. Jura looked to the fourth rank wizard saint, Warad, one of the founders of Fairy Tale. Yep, when I first heard of Fairy Tale being disbanded, I thought it was some sort of sick joke. Warad laughed as he watered his plants. It's good to see you again, Warad Sama. Urza greeted the tree man with respect. Ah, Urza, it's good to see you again as well. Warad cheerfully greeted. Personally, I think the revival of this guild brings nothing but trouble. An elderly woman, dressed up in a witch-like getup. With a black cloak, a witch hat and everything, spoke up while reading a book. Her hair is white as snow, and her skin is frail as a young maiden, and as pale as a ghost. Her eyes colored in a deep shade of blue. She looked young, younger than one would expect, but in reality, she was nearly a hundred years old and was using magic to keep up appearances. Yet no magic could enlarge her non-existing chest, she's tried many times. This witch was one of the ten wizard saints, ranked eighth, known as the charitable witch of the East, Noel. Indeed, reports indicate they are responsible for more destruction than some dark guilds. A second female voice called out, sitting at a table staring out the window while sipping some tea. Was Fiona, ranked tenth among the wizard saints, known as the monster lady. She was a young woman, although appearance-wise she looked more like a brute. With her muscles she could give Elfman a run for his money. Her hair was orange and tied into a ponytail that went over her shoulder. Yet despite her physique, she was a lady of noble blood. And was dressed in a blue frilly dress. Now, now, let's not judge them too harshly. A male voice entered the room, a fairly tall gruff looking man. He had tan skin, and messy long black hair tired up into an upwards ponytail. He also had a stubby beard, a scar in the shape of an X on his chin, and deep dark eyes. He was rather muscular, and wore a black samurai-like armor. With only with the right side of his torso left bare, revealing parts of his chest and his entire right arm. Strapped onto his red obi belt was a katana. This was also one of the wizard saint, ranked 9th, Mitsurugi. Also known as the Black Blade. They are a rowdy bunch, but still fun. Mitsurugi adopted a wide goofy-like grin on his face, earning him a glare from Noel and Fiona. Urza looked in awe at seeing so many of the wizard saints gathered in one spot. E Urza Chan, came a whisper, Urza looked to behind a couch, where the master of mermaid heel and the sixth ranked wizard Saint Beatrice, also known as the Siren, was cowering away from Jura, Mitsurugi and Warren. Master Beatrice, Urza out of curiosity, approached the Amazonian-like woman. Save me, Beatrice was near tears as she latched onto Urza while avoiding looking at Warren, Mitsurugi and Jura. Era. Her trauma of men is still as present as ever I see. Ward chuckled in a merry-like tune. B. Beatrice Dono, Jura looked slightly hurt at getting this sort of treatment from a colleague. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Beatrice frantically apologized, I just can't handle this, why do I have to be a part of the council? I just want to return to my guild, Beatrice sulked behind Urza who had a cold nervous sweat running down her forehead. While Noel shot Beatrice a glare, specifically focused on the mermaid heel's master bouncing mountains of what she called a chest. Stop with the cutesy ditzy act now Beatrice, or I will blast you away. Noelle out of jealousy was about to jump Beatrice in attack, if Mitsurugi had not held her back by lifting her up by her witch coat. Kakaka, now, now, calm your non-existing tits, Noelle. Mitsurugi cackled, to which Noelle instead turned her anger elsewhere. What was that you stinking hobo? Noel latched onto Mitsurugi and started punching him, yet it seemed to do nothing to the samurai who continued his cackling. Oi, how long do you fools intend to play around? A harsh voice came from behind Beatrice who squealed out of shock and jumped into Urza's arms. Urza struggling to keep balance as she suddenly had to carry Beatrice bridal style. S sorry, Wolfheim Sama. Beatrice cried, as the moment she had jumped into Urza's arms, it revealed a short old man about Makarov's height. Wolfheim, the third ranked amongst the wizard saints and one of the four gods of Ishgar along with Warren. He was short, and was sporting a large blue hat, 
a dark colored shirt, a light colored vest with large buttons, dark slacks decorated with diamond shaped patterns. He also wore a pair of glasses, and had a light green goatee beard. Goodness, if you only could keep the persona you have during night. Instead of this nervous wreck you are now, you would have ranked higher than Jura amongst the wizard saints. Wolfheim scolded Beatrice who whimpered and cowered away as a result. I'm sorry, Beatrice sniffed as she hoped down from Urza's arms. Now, now Wolfheim Kuhn. No need to scare the poor lady. Ward said, earning a glare from the short old man. Oi, oi, I've been meaning to say this to you for a while, get rid of that carefree attitude of yours. The Alvarez empire is growing day by day, and you sit around and make jokes. Wolfheim suddenly grew into a massive muscular mixture of gorilla and werewolf-like beast. Ah, uh, Urza suddenly felt the pressure rise in the room, although she herself was able to keep her composure. Please restrain yourself, Wolfheim Sama. Jura pleaded. Enough, a new voice called out, and instantly everyone's attention shifted to him. The air suddenly changed, more pressure added as this man entered the room. An older looking gentleman with clean cut dark purple hair and red eyes. He had a well-groomed mustache and pointy ears and a red tattoo on his forehead that resembled a cross. We are no longer wandering mages. We are council members. We must set an example for all other mages to follow. He wore a buttoned-up dress shirt, a lightly decorated vest, dark-colored slacks, and a black bow tie. He covers his ensemble with a black cape. Dracula's Hyberian, the second ranked amongst the ten wizard saints, was twirling a vine glass containing a thick red liquid that resembled blood. Hyberian Sama, Jura sighed in relief as everyone seemed to calm down upon his presence. Three of the four gods of Ishigar in the same room, I never thought I would see the day. Urza remained silent as eight out of the ten wizard saints stood around her. Things are certainly reaching a boiling point. However, our task is to return them to something a bit more tranquil, is it not? Hyberian drank his drink, and summoned forth a bottle to refill it. If it devolves to war, we stand little chance. It falls on all of us to open the path towards a peaceful resolution. Urza couldn't believe what she was hearing. The wizard saints meant they could not stand up to the Alvarez Empire, even with magic guilds backing them up. Is Alvarez really that powerful? What are the highest ranked wizard saint? Surely if all of you join forces along with Fairy Tail and the other magic guilds. The man once called one of the four gods of Ishgar like us. The man who holds the title the strongest man on the continent. God Serena. Hyberian upon mentioning that name shifted the mood in the room. Come to think of it, why is God Serena Sama not taking part in the council? Jura asked as they were missing one member besides the seventh ranked wizard Saint Makarov. And thus, the present three of the four gods of Ishgar all went silent. Oi, what's with the silent treatment? Mitsurugi questioned. What happened? Fiona questioned. Don't tell me, something's happened to God Serena Sama. Jura worried for the worst. Yet he had no idea there were worse possible fates for their number one ranked wizard saint than death. He's abandoned this land, he crossed over to the western continent and joined the empire. Dracula's Hyberian was the one to answer, and thus everyone in the room besides Wolfheim and Ward gasped in shock. Impossible. Jura gawked at the news. Urza observed the scene, looking rather horrified to learn that Ishgar's strongest mage had betrayed them. The twelve shields that protect the Emperor Spriggan, the Spriggan Twelve. He is now one of them. 12. You don't mean, Urza uttered, fearing the worst. Yes, there are 11 more mages who can stand toe to toe, with even Ishgar's mightiest mage. Such is the Alvarez Empire. Urza upon hearing this gulped down a nervous lump in her throat. 11 other mages at the same caliber as the man who is titles Ishgar's strongest. She wasn't sure as she has never witnessed God Serena in action, but she was confident Itachi should be stronger. Still, the mere thought of twelve such powerful enemies, Urza couldn't help but worry. Please be careful, Oni-san, Urza thought, as the scenery changed to somewhere in the ocean. Sailing across the sea was a massive ship, and on board was Fairy Tail's rescue team for Makarov. We're nearing the border between Ishgar and Alvarez, Mest informed Itachi who looked out at the vast ocean. HN, very good, let's go over the plan one more time. Itachi signaled for Lucy and Levy to gather around him in Mest. Okay, it will take a few days to travel to Alvarez, so we'll be making a small stop to gather some supplies. Mest, go ahead. Right, our stop is a local tourist island, Caracal. It is within the territory of the western continent, 
but neutral in the matters between Alvarez and Ishgar. So, it is not a part of the Empire. It is also where my informants are, we will hitch a ride with them to reach Alvarez undetected. Mest informed them, and with a swift movement of his hand he altered their guild emblems from the fairy tale insignia into that of Kate Shelter. Fairy tale is a far too well-known guild, we'll have to use a lesser known guild mark. Kate Shelter, huh, Itachi looked to the Kate Shelter mark on the back of his right hand. This brings back memories, Lucy said with a look of nostalgia. This was Wendy and Carla's old guild, right? Levy questioned eyeing the guild mark on Lucy. But if Caracol is a tourist island, why would we need to go through this much? Because it is still within the range of enemy territory. For all we know the local law could be Alvarez soldiers. If they recognize our guild emblem, they could warn the higher ups before we reach them. And perhaps execute Makarov on the spot. It's better to be safe than sorry. Itachi explained, and they all looked in agreement. I hope he's okay. Levy and Lucy both shared a look of concern for Makarov's well-being. Itachi and Mest were mostly focused on getting past the borders of Caracol Island and over to Alvarez in one piece. Next stop, Caracol Island, the ship announced through a loudspeaker, as the island came into view. Everyone, prepare to disembark, Mest instructed. Wait, Itachi spotted something in the distance at the island. Are those, ships? Mest grabbed some binoculars, and began trembling once he got a good look at the ships. That's a fleet of the Alvarez Imperial Navy. And thus, everyone was on high alert, Lucy and Levy pointed out they spotted more ships surrounding the island. Why are they here? I thought Caracol didn't belong to the Empire. Lucy started to look more worried, she was really glad Natsu wasn't with them now. He would most likely pick a fight right away. From the looks of it, they are doing some sort of inspection at the harbor. Mest analyzed the situation, and began looking concerned. Don't tell me they found out about my informants. Guess these marks came in handy after all, Itachi looked to the Kate Shelter emblem. Everyone, remain calm, try and not think of this as a job. We're just some working mages on vacation. Just, keep a low profile. I will deal with the hard part. Itachi snatched a pair of sunglasses from Lucy to hide his Sharingan behind the dark shades. We need to find your informants before they do, keep your eyes open and stick together. They disembarked from the ship, and went down to the harbor. Lucy and Levy keeping a low profile behind Itachi and Mest. Halt. Two Alvarez knights stopped them in their tracks. We'll be setting up a temporarily blockade of the harbor. Form a line. Everyone coming and going from the island will have their personal belongings searched. You don't need to search our bags. Itachi tilted his sunglasses down a bit, and stared into the two knights' eyes with his Sharingan rotating. The knights looked like they were in a trance. We're just tourists from a small guild here for some star mangoes. W we don't need to search your bags, you are just tourists from a small guild here for some star mangoes, they repeated what Itachi said like they were hypnotized. You and your three friends are all clear, move along. You and your three friends are all clear, move along, move along. The knights stepped aside and let Itachi, Mest, Levi and Lucy pass the gate. Once they had cleared some distance between themselves and the Alvarez knights, Mest leaned into Itachi and muttered. Those eyes of yours really do come in handy for infiltration. Indeed, although once we reach the Empire it would be wiser to simply infiltrate during the night. Would be easier to slip in and out with Makarov without being noticed. Still, there are a lot of them roaming around the city. Levy observed seeing a knight at almost every corner. We must remain cautious, Lucy added sticking closer to Levy. Then suddenly the wails and cries of what sounded like a little boy came from their left. They all turned around seeing a little young boy surrounded by four Alvarez knights. Bring back my dad, the boy cried, where'd you take him, daddy, the boy cried out for his lost father. Looks like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, the knight groaned in annoyance. Should we do something, Levy gasped in terror when she saw one of the knights had grabbed onto his blade handle. We can't. It will bring too much unwanted attention, Mest regrettably said, clearly feeling bad for the boy. Itachi stared in silence, normally in his Anbu days if he saw something like this. He would leave it be, and think nothing of it. But now, it left a bitter taste in his mouth. Wah, daddy, the boy cried to which the knight groaned and shoved the boy to the dirt, and raised his blade. Shut your filthy mouth, or I'll shut it for you. He can't be serious, a local gasped, that's a kid, man. The knight merely ignored the words of the public, and brought his blade down. Only for him to be halted, 
is a strong firm hand tightly wrapped around his wrist. What? The knights looked alarmed as Itachi had stepped in, stopping the knight from injuring or worse kill the boy. Now, now, no need to get so worked up, Itachi calmly spoke as he tightened his grip even more. You, let go or else, the knight flinched as Itachi tilted down his sunglasses, his Sharingan now visible and rotating. The heat must be getting to you, please, do lay back and relax with a cold refreshing drink. In response to Itachi's words, the knight looked slightly wobbly. Yes, that sounds nice, the knight dropped his blade and walked over to a local stand for a drink. W what did you? The other three knights gasped in confusion as Itachi's Sharingan caught their gaze. Why don't you join your friend and have a well-earned lunch break? The knights followed Itachi's instructions to the letter and joined their comrade at the stand for lunch. Good job, Lucy praised letting out a sigh of relief that they didn't have to blow their cover. Come on little guy, we'll help you find your dad. Levy comforted the crying boy as she gently grabbed onto his hand and began searching. Mest, go and see if you can find our informants, Lucy remain on high alert. Itachi kept an eye out for any nearby knights that may have witnessed him confront those knights earlier. Luckily there didn't seem to be any. In the meantime, I shall keep a low profile. Itachi was instantly found sitting by the Star Mango Gelato stand, enjoying some of this tropical treat. You just wanted to actually try some Star Mango, didn't you? Lucy sweat dropped, knowing full well of Itachi's sweet tooth. But anyway, I will get going then. Mest teleported with his space magic. Not long after, Levy returned having helped the boy find his father. And like Lucy did, sweat dropped over seeing the serious looking Itachi enjoying himself some star mango. Ah, thank you for this treat. Itachi bowed his head respectfully to the shopkeep. Ah, no worries, say are you lot from Ishgar? No, why, Itachi lied, when undercover he can't afford to slip up not even once. One could never know who was a spy for the enemy or not. Ah nothing. Just I am planning on opening shop up in Ishgar. I am saving up money selling star mango gelato in this rundown stand, and one day hopefully move my business to Ishgar. Is that so? Sounds great. Itachi gave a tiny smile, thinking in his head Urza would be over the moon when that day would come. Although, it might take a while, I usually get mostly customers during the holidays. And this rundown stand doesn't help much in increasing interest rate. But I always say dream big or go home. The man lightheartedly laughed. But pray tell, if you ain't from Ishgar, where exactly are you? The shopkeeper was prevented from asking his question, when suddenly his stand blew up. Itachi backflipped as debris blew around them. Lucy and Levy both squealed in shock, while the shopkeep was gaping in weeping tears. Passed. With flying colors, the sound of clapping reached their ears. Itachi glared at this individual from the corner of his eye, and Lucy and Levy quickly went on full alert ready for combat. I'm Marin Hollow. I'm a member of the Brandish Squad from the Alvarez Imperial Army. A rather scrawny looking young man with spiky wild black hair. Dressed in purple trousers and a matching blazer with a white undershirt underneath. He also sports a purple bandana with a pair of tinted sunglasses. He kept on clapping while eyeing Lucy and Levy, hungrily. This guy, just laid waste to my dreams, the shopkeeper wept over his hard work having gone to waste. Here, Itachi tossed him a full coin purse. It might not be much, but it will help you get back on your feet. Now run, Itachi instructed and the man bowed his head with gratitude and ran as fast as his legs could carry him. You guys thought you could hide from us. Hey, laughable, Marin chuckled. Lucy quickly held out one of her zodiac keys. Open gate of the archer. Yet nothing happened. That won't work. This space here belongs to me. Marin smugly declared seeing Lucy. Feudal attempted to summon her spirits. All manners of space-like magic is useless against me, including celestial magic. Oh, and one little tidbit I forgot to mention, those that have been defeated by my edicts of space. My body, Lucy gasped in shock as she began to vanish. Lu Chan, Levy tried to grab onto her, but to no avail. She got a one-way trip to my personal relaxation dimension, he sounded giddy as Lucy completely vanished into his dimension. I will make sure to play with her gently, she's mine now. I don't have time for your trickery. Return Lucy at once. Itachi sent a death glare at Marin, making him flinch a bit. Although he then scowled at Itachi, glaring right back at him. Whereas you, failed, douchebag. Marin roared at Itachi, who didn't even budge or flinch. I believe this failed piece of garbage belongs to you. 
With a flick of his fingers appeared a beaten and bruised mist. He had the nerve to use space magic in my presence. All of you failures are filthy eyesores. Space magic was never meant to be wielded by uncouth Neanderthals. Return Lucy at once, or die. Itachi gave one last warning, this time unleashing his bloodlust with his cold tone of voice. WH what? Marin backed up a bit. Frightened at the bloodlust from Itachi, it felt like if he made a move he would die on the spot. D don't look down on me you little shit. Marin vanished from where he stood, and in a flash appeared behind Itachi. I'm a space magic specialist. Marin threw a punch towards Itachi's back, only for his hand to be shockingly caught by Itachi who didn't even need to bat an eye at Marin to see his attack coming. Huh, wait, what, Marin freezes up as suddenly the whole island begins shaking. What is more the clouds turned dark, and shadowed over the heating sun. Itachi slowly turned his head, looking at Marin with his Sharingan glowing from the corner of his eye. I sense a much larger power on this island. Your master I assume, a pet should know better than to stray too far away from their master's leash. Marin looked absolutely mortified, caught in Itachi's gaze. Unable to think or react from feeling the intense pressure of Itachi's iron grip and bloodlust. Shivers ran down his spine at this sensation of power. I am possible, I thought they were exaggerating about you, this caused Itachi to raise a brow. To think anyone besides the twelve had this kind of power, Marin began sweating bullets, and like a helpless infant crying for his mother he shouted. Be brandish sama, Marin shouts in terror for his master's aid. And on K, Itachi picks up on a massive level of magic power nearby. Really nearby, Itachi turns his gaze to his left, seeing a bored looking woman finishing her mango gelato. And you shouldn't lay hands on someone else's pet. Levy and Mest quiver in terror at feeling this woman's power. Mest already on the ground is left unable to move a muscle. And Levy falls over as her body trembles in terror. Then there was Itachi, who merely gave this woman a dangerous glare. She was a beautiful young woman, with green hair cut into a bob cut with two purple cross accessories attached to her heads to look like horns. Her attire was a golden armored decorated swimsuit, showing off her massive bust that could rival Lucis. And a golden fancy coat with purple flower patterns across its design along with purple fur around the collar. And to top it off she wore a dark brown like choker around her neck with chains attached to it. On her upper right thigh, you could find the Alvarez Empire emblem. Brandish Sama, please save me, Marin pleaded still caught in Itachi's iron grip. Shut it, Brandish sent her pet a harsh cold glare, making Marin freeze up even more. The adults are talking, Itachi released Marin from his grip, the space mage specialist crawling away in pure terror. Itachi's full attention focused on Brandish, one thought going through his mind. She's different, she's dangerous, Itachi remained calm and on guard. Marin, return that girl at once. Brandish ordered. Huh, but Brandish Sama, you said you'd let me keep anyone I found I wanted for my collection, Brandish in response to her pet's disobedience, flashed her powerful aura. The island began to look like it was closing in on them even. Itachi focused with his Sharingan, seeing strange waves of magical power emitting from beneath Brandish's feet. Do not make me repeat myself. Understood. Marin saluted and out of fear, released Lucy from his dimension. Lu Chan. Levy rushed to Lucy's aid. My relaxation dimension isn't a dangerous place by any means, so she's fine, just fine, Marin seemed to have regained his confidence and composure now that Brandish was here to deal with Itachi. The heck was that room, so creepy, Lucy shivered, and Levy shivered just from seeing Lucy look like that. Lucy however suddenly felt this intense pressure around them. Hesitantly she turned her head around to see Brandish. Who is that, what terrifying level of magic power, is she from Alvarez? Brandish Sama, our mission was to capture the spy and find out what they know. If we return empty handed, the other twelve will. That is of no concern to me. Besides it won't matter, Ishgar wouldn't dare to pick a fight with the Alvarez Empire. I've told everyone time and time again. Our focus should be on that Madara. Brandish mentioning Madara caused Itachi to look alarmed. Well, yes although that may be true, Madara isn't an official enemy of the Alvarez Empire. But he isn't exactly an ally either, besides if we don't capture the spy, it will mean a loss of face for us. We'll have failed a mission given by August himself. Upon mentioning that name, Brandish, attitude seemed to shift. Ah, right, Gramps was the one who assigned us this mission, Brandish then turned to glare at Itachi, looking disgusted. That man, he reminds me of him. Brandish hissed, 
obviously meaning Madara. In an instant, Lucy, Levi and Mest all shrank into the size of dolls one after the other. Itachi widened his eyes in shock, and took a leap back so he wouldn't suffer the same fate. WH what? Lucy squealed in a squeaky voice due to her small stature. Brandish suddenly walked up to them, and swapped her hand down grabbing Lucy, Levi and Mest. What kind of magic is this? Levi asked in a squeaky voice. Itachi clicked his tongue out of frustration for his team having been captured and got into a fighting stance. This is going to be such a pain, could you like maybe surrender? Makes this hole a lot easier. Brandish sighed looking rather annoyed. No, Itachi replied in a harsh tone, and Brandish just sighs. Your funeral, Brandish merely kicks up some beach sand, the sand grains suddenly expanding into gigantic boulder-like size one after the other. Itachi infuses his fists with chakra, and smashes his fist into the nearest boulder sand grain, shattering it to pieces. Itachi moved at light-like speed, throwing punch after punch smashing all the boulders into pieces. Oh, not bad. Brandish looks bored, as she grabs a soda from a nearby stand, sipping it from the straw. Brandish unleashed a strange wave of magic from her, that Itachi was only able to detect with his Sharingan. Itachi jumped away and avoided the waves. And instead the waves hid Marin, and he shrank into the size of a mouse. She can change the mass of things, people as well. Itachi takes a leap backwards to avoid the waves still stretching towards him. Eventually he notices the waves stop stretching. Is that her maximum range? Itachi thought to himself, but then noticed the land beneath him shrinking in towards Brandish. If he wasn't already midair, he would be pulled into her waves along with the land. But that doesn't seem to matter much. Itachi reached into his back pouch with his weapons, and tossed out two shuriken throwing stars. Brandish scoffed at Itachi's attempt, and increased the size of a pebble into that of a massive rock to which the shurikens deflected off from it. Itachi narrowed his gaze at this, taking a mental note. She didn't shrink them, then again maybe there was no need. Let's see. Itachi took yet another leap as Brandish attempted to shorten their distance by shrinking the land beneath them. Itachi tossed another shuriken, followed by flashing a set of hand seals. Itachi threw his right arm behind his back, generating bolts of electricity. With a swift punch, Itachi shot a bolt of lightning towards Brandish. Itachi intently analyzed Brandish with his Sharingan, seeing waves of magic power emitting from her hand once again aimed for the bolt of lightning. And once the lightning bolt came into contact with the waves, it shrank into the size of a mere glint and thus doing nothing to her. Brandish saw the incoming shuriken, and tilted her head to the side. Brandish hisses as the shuriken flies by her, lightly scratching her cheek drawing blood. Hello there, Itachi smiled taking note of what he just witnessed. Brandish Sama, Marin cried at seeing his master's beautiful face having suffered a minor scratch. Guess you aren't that impressive, Itachi commented, earning a glare from Marin. You fool, with Brandish Sama's power, she can shrink the mass of all your attacks. Marin shouted boldly at Itachi with his squeaky voice. So, if it doesn't have mass, then she can't shrink it. Itachi smirked, and Marin flinched and hesitantly looked to Brandish who glared down at Marin with a scowl. Itachi spat out a wave of fire. Brandish clicked her tongue and increased the mass of a pebble into the size of a boulder to block the fire. Brandish stared at the boulder as it was torn apart by the fire, suddenly the boulder collapsed into Brandish's shock Itachi came jumping out from it. Brandish instantly shut her eyes, to avoid getting caught by Itachi's genjutsu. And Itachi threw a spin kick to Brandish's abdomen, sending her skidding backwards. Brandish also dropped the doll-sized Lucy, Levi and Mest from her grasp and Itachi caught them. Seems you have some experience in dealing with Sharingan, Madara I assume. Brandish didn't dignify Itachi with a respond, although her look of anger confirmed it. Seems those of the Alvarez Empire have already encountered Madara. She clutched her left hand onto her abdomen, having suffered a minor bruise. Itachi, what about us? Lucy squeaked from within Itachi's palm. Don't worry, if her spell doesn't have a time limit, I will force her to undo it. Itachi assured and put his shrunken comrades into his pouch. My magic, Command T has granted me the title, Country Demolisher, Brandish. I have crushed countries and armies single-handedly. Brandish flashed her magic power in the form of a powerful green aura unleashed in a mighty wave. The ground beneath Itachi began moving like waves on the sea, and suddenly exploded out a spike of earth pushing Itachi far up into the sky beyond the clouds. In response, Itachi quickly cloaked himself with his Suzano, 
its ribcage shielding Itachi from damage. The Suzano growing into a massive upper body skeleton, generating blades from its four arms. The Suzano slicing up the earth up into four slices, giving Itachi the chance to slip away from Brandish's attack. Brandish looks up to the clouds for any signs of Itachi, her concentration interrupted by her pet. You um, Brandish-sama, could you maybe restore me to my original size? Marin pleaded, and Brandish merely looked down on him like he was an unpleasant bug. Ha, very well, Brandish sighed looking annoyed, and with a flick of her fingers restored Marin to his original size. Huh, Brandish noticed a strange orange glow reflecting from the ocean, besides the reflection of the sun. Brandish and Marin quickly looked up, seeing a massive spectral skeleton coming raining down. Brandish took a leap backwards, and Marin desperately teleported himself away. And coming crashing like a meteor, landed Itachi with his upper body skeleton Suzano. The spectral beast letting out a roar that shook the space around them. Brandish glared at the beast and Itachi, with a bead of nervous sweat running down her forehead. Let's see, you shrink this, Itachi's Mangeku shined in a red dim light. HN, Brandish with a flick of her fingers cancelled out her magic on Lucy, Levy and Mest making them grow out from Itachi's pouch. Ouch, Levy grunted as Lucy landed on top of her. Sorry, Levy Chan, Lucy grunted, and Mest was still unconscious. Marin, deal with those two. I will take on Itachi Uchiha, Brandish ordered, although it made Itachi look with a questioning gaze. How did she know his name? He hadn't presented himself. Did she know him because of Madara? No problem, Brandish Sama, that a plus celestial wizard is no match for my space magic. Marin declared confidently, although just when it looked like Lucy was reaching for her keys, she instead reached for something else on her belt. Marin then began looking transparent as he was about to teleport. You're mine. Marin reappeared behind Lucy and Levy. Lucy swiftly turned around, and swung her whip, slashing it across Marin's face. Don't underestimate me. Lucy moved like an acrobat, spinning onto her hands and delivering a series of spin kicks into the stunned-looking Marin. Why you bitch? Marin was silenced as fire exploded into his face. Marin stumbled backwards, as Levy blasted him with her solid script magic. A one-trick pony like you, can't catch us off guard twice. Lucy had rushed behind Marin, and swung her whip wrapping it around his neck strangling him. A one-trick pony, I will just teleport out from this. Marin had veins visible around his temple. Huh, wait what, why can't I teleport? Then suddenly Marin noticed some writing on the whip. I used some of my new skills obtained working for the magic council. Levy held her magic pen, having embodied magic nullifying seals onto the whip. To capture dark wizards, we would need to nullify their magic after all. Lucy tightened her hold on the whip, strangling Marin and shutting off his air supply. D damn you, Marin hissed under his breath. Solid script. Iron, iron metal shaped into the word, iron, appeared hovering over Marin's head, was dropped down onto his head knocking him out ice cold. And that's how you do it. Lucy high-fived Levy as they celebrated over the defeated Marin. Marin. Brandish looked slightly shocked over how quickly her pet was defeated. But she quickly had to refocus on Itachi, as she dodged by taking a leap backwards to avoid the Suzano smashing its skeleton fist down on her. Brandish swapped her hand down, grabbing a rock. Command T. Expansion. Brandish tossed the rock over Itachi and his Suzano, expanding the rock into the size of a meteorite threatening to smash Itachi, Lucy, Levy, Mest and even the unconscious Marin. No, it was threatening to smash the entire island. Itachi focused onto his Suzano, making it grow flesh and armor. Itachi's Suzano quickly held one arm up summoning forth the Yada Mirror Shield to block the incoming meteor. The Suzano struggled to hold back the meteor, its arm wavering under the weight of the meteorite. Then the Yada Mirror took its effect, pushing the meteor back with incredible force so it flung over the island and landed into the ocean. However, that didn't end the threat to annihilate the island. The sea looking unruly as the force of the meteorite, created a massive tsunami. Itachi quickly formed the hand seals for his jutsu, and generated black demonic flame marks around his body to increase his energy level. Earth style. Mud wall. Slamming his head onto the beach, Itachi created a large great wall surrounding this side of the island. The wall was tall enough, and dense enough to hold back the destructive tsunami. Figures, someone like you wouldn't want innocent people to get hurt. Brandish took a sharp golden hair pin out from her hair, aiming it at the Suzano. 
didn't think I would be thankful to Madara, without him, I wouldn't even know how to deal with the Sharingan. Brandish flicked the sharp hair pin towards Itachi, like a bullet having fired out from a gun. Command T, expansion, Brandish uttered to which the pin expanded into the size of a gigantic spear at the size of a tall tree. Itachi however, countered it with his Yata mirror, and quickly swung the Tatsuka blade and sliced the giant hairpin in two. The Suzano threw its two available hands behind its back, generating violent rotating Yusaka beads. Yusaka Magatama, and flung those destructive spectral energy beads. Brandish responded with expanding the very island's base, expanding the height of the island far above sea level, and by pushing the island upwards the Yusaka beads clashed to rising the ground before they reached Brandish, causing two massive explosions. The screams of the civilians of the island were heard as they all fell over from this sudden force of gravity. Itachi himself was barely able to remain standing within the space of his Suzano. I see, I think I have your magic fully figured out, Itachi declared and Brandish looked at him with a questioning gaze. You can shrink or increase the mass of objects, spells and people. However, if the thing in question doesn't have mass then you are unable to shrink it. Such is the spectral energy of my Suzano, nor me while I am protected by it. Otherwise you would have shrunk me, or maybe expanded the size of my organs until I popped. Brandish flinched, her glare intensifying proving Itachi's words. And, you can only focus on one thing at a time. As I proved when I threw that shuriken earlier, and shot a bolt of lightning at you. You decided to shrink the lightning bolt, which would have dealt more damage over the shuriken. Evident as you had to dodge it. Brandish clicked her tongue, as she brought her hand over the small cut on her face left by the shuriken. And there is a certain range of your magic, your body sends waves of magic power to shrink or increase the mass of things. A way to avoid those waves is to be out of your range. To others those waves might be invisible, but nothing gets past my eyes. So, I know the exact range of your powers. Atachi's Mangeku flares in a bright red color. Well played, you are just like Madara. He figured it out pretty quickly as well. Then he used those damn eyes of his to knock me out. Although, you missed one thing. Brandish looked towards the unconscious Marin, and shrank him into the size of an ant. She picked up the little Marin carefully not to crush him, and put him into the pocket of her coat. This is starting to annoy me, Brandish glared at Itachi, as he jumped at her with his Suzano. Brandish responded with tapping her foot. Command T, reduction, and in almost an instance, the entire island shrank down. Itachi fell with his Suzano plummeting into the sea. Itachi's Suzano vanished underneath the waters, as he swam back up to the surface. Taking in a breath of air, surrounded by the locals of the island, and his comrades. Lucy and Levy struggling to hold messed up and afloat. WH what just happened? Where's the island? Lucy looked around. I can easily close the distance you make, by shrinking this very island. Everyone looks to Brandish, standing on top of the island that was only big enough for her alone to stand there. Looking down on them like they were insignificant bugs and she was a goddess. Alvarez has 11 other wizards of my caliber. Do yourself a favor and give up while you still can. We're not leaving without Makarov. Lucy declared, and Brandish eyed her suspiciously. Also taking note that Lucis Guild Mark changed back into her fairy tale emblem. Hey, is that so? Well if you don't leave, then we'll just kill him. Brandish threatened, although they all realized one thing from this threat. Yes, you heard me. Makarov lives. Although don't worry, once I capture all of you, I will bring you to him. Brandish ready to shrink them so she could bring them in. Wait, Itachi stopped her, and swam closer to Lucy, Levy and Mest whose body was flinching. Brandish looked to Itachi, waiting for him to speak. Question, how did you find out who we were? How did you know my name? Brandish narrowed her gaze on Itachi, cracking a small smile. The scene switched into a cheering crowd at the capital in the Alvarez Empire. It was almost like a festival. The crowd cheering how, his majesty has returned, and chanting his name, Emperor Spriggan, and they even mentioned how it has been a year since he last was here. At the castle, awaited the old dwarf of a man, Makarov. Having grown a beard over the past year. At last, Makarov uttered. I didn't expect you to have remained here for a year, a young man of average height, and long blue hair bunched up into a ponytail by a golden brace. The ponytail hanging over his right shoulder. His eyes looked on alert, their red irises hidden under a pair of glasses. 
his attire consisting of dark dress pants and a white collared dress shirt with a blue tie hanging around his neck. And over it he wore a trench coat with a white border, and matching the color of his tie. Dark markings branded diagonally from the left shoulder and sleeve and run down the front and back of his coat. Invil, Makarov greeted a member of the Spriggan 12, Invil Yura. Known as the Winter General. I told you I am determined to negotiate with the Emperor. No matter the cause. His Majesty is well aware of the need to maintain peace with Ishgar. And if you should get his seal of approval, the Twelve will back down. However, if he does not, I trust you understand what that means. Inbil looked down on Makarov. Yes, I am aware. But I have full faith, despite your words, I have full faith the negotiations will go smoothly. And after all this has been settled, you won't need to see me again. And I will return to my family. Makarov ignored Invel's glare. We shall see, here he comes. Invel announced, heading back down to greet the emperor personally. Makarov looked down, seeing a single figure walking towards the castle, while the crowd cheered at seeing him. Although, Makarov was a far cry from cheering. In fact, he looked only in horror. The scene switched back to the ocean, with Itachi and the rescue team facing Brandish. There isn't a single member of the Twelve, that doesn't know your name. Or who you are. After all, you are the Emperor's very own creation. When Itachi processed Brandish's words, he widened his eyes in shock. It can't be. The scene switched back to Makarov at the capital of the Empire. Makarov looked just as shocked as Itachi was. It can't be. Makarov looked closer, and without a doubt. The figure of a young man dressed in black, the man known as the Emperor Spriggan. Was indeed, the infamous black wizard, Zirf. Zirf, Makarov trembled and fell to his knees, the hope of negotiations vanishing with the crowd cheering. Long live his majesty the emperor. Back with Itachi and the rescue team, Itachi was still to recover from the shock of discovering the emperor of Alvarez was none other than Zirf. And thus, realizing the real threat the Alvarez empire posed. So, basically, we got caught because you recognized me. Itachi clicks his tongue over the fact the mission failed because of him. Now, Time to bring you to Makarov, and before his majesty. Brandish readied to shrink them, although Itachi in response flared his power. However, before the two could break out into a brawl, Itachi, Lucy, Levy and Mest all vanished in a flash. Brandish looked shocked, at seeing them vanish out of nowhere. I see, the one using space magic amongst them that was knocked out. He woke up and teleported them. Since Marin was out cold, there was nothing to stop him from teleporting. The ships of the Alvarez Navy, rounded up the citizens of the Shrunken Island. And helped them onboard their ships. Brandish stood on the Shrunken Island, and gave a sigh of relief. I suppose it is for the best, I'm not sure I could have taken him on if he got serious, Brandish had a bit of a cold sweat at the thought of the power Itachi unleashed just before they teleported. Meanwhile, Itachi and the rescue team appeared into what appeared to be the inside of some sort of temple. That was close, thank you Mest. Lucy and Levy breathed out a sigh of relief, and thanked Mest for getting them out of there. Where are we? Itachi lowered his aura, looking around at the new scenery. We're just off the coast of Caracal Island, underwater. Mest replied. Underwater. Both Lucy and Levy rushed to a nearby window, indeed confirming Mest's claim. As they saw fish swimming around. Before I was captured, I made contact without informants. They told me to teleport to these coordinates. Mest revealed. An underwater temple, Itachi suddenly began losing balance, as the underwater temple moved unruly. And suddenly speed at intense speed. A vehicle, now I'm glad I didn't bring Natsu or any of the dragon slayers. Welcome, a voice greeted, and they all turned around to see two people sitting at two thrones next to each other. This is the sailing temple, Olympia. And I'm its captain Serrano. And this is my first mate, Sasori. The woman formerly known as Angel, warmly and cutely greeted her guests. While Sasori sat next to her, enjoying some hot soba. Both of them dressed in a bathing suit. Angel in a white bikini that looked like it was decorated with feathers. And Sasori in black swimming trunks. Sasori, Itachi looked surprised at seeing who the informants Mest spoke of were. Yo, Uchiha, Sasori casually greeted and sipped up some soba. H hey, are they the informants? Lucy asked Mest, who nodded in confirmation. Why not use Eric? His hearing would be perfect for gathering intel. Itachi asked Mest who groaned in response. If I did, he would never get off my case. Mest grumbled. Oh well, 
Sasori has an excellent intelligence network. So, I suppose we could manage without Eric. Itachi shrugged, although he found Mest's reasoning to be foolish. But one question springs to mind, how did you get caught? Sasori finished his soba, and then drank a bottle of soda. Not the same reason as you, I'm not that well known of a demon of the books of Zirf. Serrano just slipped up, Sasori shot his companion a glare, making her blush before Sasori's intense gaze. Because you got caught and fled the island, Lucy uttered as she and Levy stared with deadpanned expressions at Serrano. The entire island vanished, Levy finished, hey, I barely made it out in one piece. Had it not been for Sasori Kian, Serrano whined. Who are you calling, Sasori Kian? Sasori glared at Serrano, making her blush again. Well, truth be told I wouldn't be doing this if I hadn't owed Mest a favor for letting me and the cease out. And Sasori Kian also volunteered making it a plus, Serrano added, whispering the last part under her breath. Sasori although heard her, but ignored it and starting enjoying a popsicle. You sure have an appetite, Itachi commented. Lay off, I have been without a human body for years. One thing I missed as a puppet, was the taste of food. Sasori shot a glare at Itachi. Hey, I suppose, anyway, where is this ship headed? Itachi asked seeing as they were moving at incredible speed. To the Alvarez Empire's capital. To Makarov, Sasori replied. You know where Makarov is. Lucy and Levy brightened up with joy. That's right baby. Serrano smiled at Lucy as she went to the controls of Olympia, speeding it up. Meanwhile, back in Magnolia. The fairy tale Guildhall was nearly completely rebuilt under the guidance of Urza and Mira Jane. The two current acting masters were strolling through town, accompanied by Myra's younger sister Lizana. Each of them carrying shopping bags. Mira was humming in a merry tune. She had been a little upset that Itachi had to leave so soon. But she did understand why. Makarov practically raised her and was the closest thing the eldest Strauss sibling had to a father. Of course, he needed to be at her and Itachi's wedding. I think we have everything now. We have a caterer for the wedding, we have the rings, decorations, and since we'll be using the Guildhall as a venue and the place to hold the ceremony, seems we are all set. Lizana went through the list they and the rest of the girls in the guild have made for the wedding. And we even have a wedding dress ready for you Mirane. Do we have a tuxedo for Oni-san? Urza snatched the list, going over it to be sure. Yeah, I think so, don't we, Mirane? Lizana and Urza both looked to the bride-to-be, only to discover she was lagging behind a bit. Mirane, Lizana and Urza both looked with questioning gazes as Mira was eyeing something in the window of a certain store. Without hesitation, she walked in, the sound of the bell ringing as she entered the store. And a few seconds later she walked back out again. Thank you for your purchase. The store clerk called out as Mira exited the store. Mirane, did you find something we were missing? Lizana eyed the new shopping bag Mira was holding. Mira responded by shaking her head. Just something I need to check. That was, a pharmacy, right? Urza peeked over Myra's shoulder, seeing the sign of the store Mira had been in. What did you need in there? Are you ill? I'm not sure, although, Mira gently stroked her right hand over her stomach area. I have a feeling I know what it is. Mira smiled brightly with joy. Urza and Lizana blinked a couple of times at Myra's response. Mira nay, you don't mean. Lizana seemed to have a good idea what Mira Jane was referring to, although found herself unable to ask. Whereas Urza seemed clueless. Now, shall we go? There is one more thing I would like to buy, Mira quickly changed the topic, and strolled right past Urza and Lizana before they could protest or ask any questions. Urza and Lizana quickly follow after her, and to their surprise Mira stops before a blacksmith shop. What are you going to buy here? Urza asked familiar with the shop as she usually purchased weapons and such from this blacksmith. Mira looked to them and giggled a bit. She smiled at them cutely, while playfully holding her finger in front of her lips, and giving them a wink. It's a secret. Back in the Alvarez Empire, Zirf or rather Emperor Spriggan entered his palace. No guards, only one man stood there to greet him. His loyal advisor, Inval. Welcome back, your majesty. I'm back, Inval. As always without any emotion in his gaze, he greeted his loyal pawn. This might be a bit sudden, but do me a favor and gather the twelve. Doing so this instant will be, difficult to say the least. Inbal looked troubled over having to call every single Spriggan twelve member back to the capital. If I had it in me to predict when the first winds of spring would blow you through the palace gates, I'd have had them assembled ahead of time. 
My, my, do you mean to tell me I'm a fickle breeze? Zirf casually cracked the tiniest smile, yet his tone of voice was cold and empty. Neither amused, nor offended, there was simple no feeling inside his black heart. Wind, a black wind. No, a dark storm that brings death. Two set of footsteps entered the chambers. A spring breeze does not befit his majesty. A young slender woman, with wavy short golden hair reaching only the base of her nape. Her hair is mostly swept back, with some bangs hanging down over her forehead. Her eyes were golden like her hair. She had the Alvarez Empire mark branded on the outer side of her left calf. Her attire consisted of quite the revealing top, a simple red bandeau holding up her massive bust. She lower attire consisted of loose, pin-striped red and black capri pants, with the end of the legs tightened around her calves. With a black cloak tied by its sleeves around her waist, her left forearm is covered by a tight bracer with a wing-like ornament attached to it beneath her elbow. While her right arm is encased in golden armor, and on her feet a simple pair of sandals, one of the Spriggan Twelve, De Maria Yesta, titled, Warrior Queen, while next to her was a cackling young man with tan brown skin. Desert, his hair wild, messy, spiky, and dark brown. That's it, a dust storm dancing over the lands of death is most fitting. He was relatively muscular, and of average height. He holds the symbol of Alvarez branded below his right shoulder. His attire consisted of a light golden cloth tied around his neck and upper torso, leaving his upper body bare. He also wore baggy, brown-colored trousers with an upper portion that is lighter in color. His body was decorated with a pair of two large brown spherical earrings, gold bracelets on each of his wrists, and gold bands on each of his biceps. And his outfit is completed with a golden scarf bearing an eye on the region covering his forehead. Ajil Ramel, another member of the Spriggan 12, titled, Desert King. Demaria, Ajil, you both seem well. Zirf casually greeted his other pawns. Inval looked sternly at his other fellow Spriggan 12 members. Watch your tone when addressing his majesty. Show some respect. It's fine Inval, Zirf assured, truly he didn't care what these meaningless pawns said about him. Glad to see you back, your majesty. As requested, I have taken care of things in your absence. An older rougher voice entered the room, the sound of footsteps, and the tapping of a staff followed with this voice. Excellent, I knew I could rely on you. August. Zirf praised who he possibly considered his most valued pawn. But a pawn was still a pawn nonetheless. I must say, you seem to be in a rather chipper mood, your majesty. It appears that your skies have brightened since our last encounter. August, he was an older looking gentleman. He was fairly tall and fair skinned for his age. His eyes were sort of blackish, and he had roughly shoulder length wavy grayish white hair, with the majority of his bangs swept leftward. He has a short mustache, and lengthy, mildly thin beard that reaches down to his upper torso. The beard links to his main hair via sideburns. Additionally, he has thick eyebrows. I suppose so. Zirf gave a mild chuckle, he was in a good mood compared to his usual self. So, does that mean you've got an answer? About Ragnarok. For clothing August was dressed in a white garment reaching past his knees with the ends tattered, and he had a black belt tied around his waist. And a dark purple robe with the ends also tattered, with the Alvarez symbol sewn into the back of the robe. Around the collar of his neck was a dark spherical clip attached. And an ominous dark ring on his right middle finger. And plain dark high boots to complete the outfit. In his hand he held a magic staff, with a dark purple orb on the top. This was August, not only a member of the Spriggan 12, but also the leader and Zeref's right-hand man. Titled the, Wizard King, a title which alone spoke of his vast knowledge and power. Yes, although in Ishgar it is called the Dragon King Festival. A battle, sweet, fucking sweet, Ajil cheered with excitement. Not so fast, the booming voice, of Makarov echoed through the hallway. The old dwarf standing tall before the emperor. The negotiations haven't even started, Makarov's words caused Ajil to scowl at the old man. Oh yeah, and what stops me from burying you in the desert, old man? Ajil looked down on Makarov, condescendingly. Makarov always hated people looking down on him, so he responded in kind and grew into gigantic enormous size. His size threatening to go beyond even the ceiling, the old man glared down on Ajil who didn't seem threatened in the slightest and merely chuckled. Enough. Zeref's orders made even Ajil back down, with a slight cold nervous sweat. He is our guest after all. Makarov shrank back to his dwarf size, and looked at Zirf hesitantly. 
Then he went down on one knee and kneeled before the emperor. It is a great honor to meet you, your majesty. Makarov held back the sarcasm in his voice to the best of his abilities. Zirf smiled down upon the old dwarf of a man. August, make sure all the Spriggan Twelve are present for the upcoming meeting. The rest of you, leave us alone. I have much to discuss with Makarov, his servants did as they were told, and left Zirf and Makarov be. Please, follow me. Zirf guided Makarov outside on the balcony of his palace looking over the vast ocean, where on the other end somewhere laid Ishgar. Are you the Emperor Spriggan, or are you Zirf? Makarov didn't really know much about this young man, known as Zirf, or perhaps Spriggan. I am both. To you all, I am Zirf. And here I am Spriggan. But if you insist on choosing one, then I suppose Zirf. I've been looking for a reason to live in this world that keeps rejecting me. It's already been over 400 years. I have killed, created monsters, resurrected dead men from an alternate world, I have even encountered beings of the supernatural such as demons. Makarov took a small step back, not wanting to be too close to Zirf and be killed from his curse. How did you come to be Emperor Spriggan? In preparation for the Dragon King Festival, I created this country many centuries ago. At first it was a small country, but over time it absorbed many guilds, and before I knew it, a huge organization that went by the name Alvarez Empire had been formed. Somewhere along the way, I came up with the name Emperor Spriggan. All to get your hands on the Lumen Histoire, Makarov went straight to address the elephant in the room. There is no need to hide it, I know its proper name. The purest form of magic, a spell even mightier than the three grand fairy spells. The ultimate hidden magic, fairy heart. Zirf grew a sadistic smirk. So, it's finally come full circle. You're after fairy heart because you're Zirf. Makarov glared at the black wizard. That's right, but that is only something I decided on recently. After all, this empire was nothing more than power I initially gathered to counter Acknologia. And even Madara if needed, our attempted invasion of Ishgar ten years ago was not of my doing. Among the twelve there are some that do not know the meaning of, no. I had to step in to stop them, since it wasn't the right time. Arg, so you weren't afraid of Ishgar's power and weaponry? Makarov looked in horror. Of course, that was a factor I had to use to convince the twelve to back down. We would have lost many soldiers if we invaded. But I do not care for the loss of pawns that much, but Alvarez as it is now, has no intention of losing to either Ishgar, Acnologia or Madara. So, there is no room for negotiation. Makarov was beyond mortified, he had no hope to save his children. This had all been for nothing. I'm afraid not, a true Dragon King festival will soon commence. The Black Wizard, the Dragon King, two demonic gods, and you humans. The time has come, to decide who will survive. Zirf looked calm as ever as he spoke such dire words, while Makarov was trembling in fear. Images in Zeref's head of his Alvarez empire backing him up. Facing the Black Dragon Acnologia. Two demonic beings of darkness, Itachi and Madara, and Natsu with the fairy tale guild backing him up. Although I won't call it a war, rather a one-sided annihilation. Zeref's eyes turned blood red, as his malice leaked from his very being. I won't hand over the first to the likes of you. Makarov boldly declared and expanded his right arm into giant size, ready to pummel Zirf. Although he was blown back by an invisible force, the intense gravity of Zeref's power pushing Makarov to his knees. I must admit, I am slightly thankful for what you have done. Thank you for raising Natsu. Zeref's words made Makarov wonder what Natsu's relationship was to the Black Wizard. I'll put you out of your misery soon. And I'll deliver your body to Natsu. I wonder how much rage will consume him. Hopefully enough for him to come looking for me. Makarov groaned in pain as Zirf rambled on. I do look forward to reunite with my brother. Makarov widened his eyes upon what he heard. It was impossible. Natsu would have to be hundreds of years old. Ah. Makarov widened his eyes as a distant memory replayed in his mind. Back when his foolish grandson tried to take over Fairy Tail during what was known as the Battle of Fairy Tail. Flashback Natsu rushed towards the exit, although was met with Freed's runes blocking him like a wall. Don't tell me you are over 80. Makarov gaped in shock as the barrier said no one over 80 might pass through. Flashback end, Natsu, my boy, Makarov groaned, having discovered something horrific about one of his children. Impossible, Natsu joined us when he was a child. You filthy, little demon. Makarov glared at Zirf. Close enough. Spriggan is actually the name of a filthy little fairy. 
In honor of my beloved Mavis, I choose that name. Farewell, Makarov. Zirf prepared a death wave to be released from his body. Although right then and there, a flash appeared around Makarov. And for a short moment, the image of Mest appeared grabbing onto Makarov before vanishing in a flash again, is this. Ah, my dearest E has come, Zirf sensed the presence of Itachi not far away from the palace. Mest appeared in a thick dense forest a bit away from the capital. Mest was gasping for air, sweating from having witnessed Zirf in all his glory. Master, Lucy and Levy together greeted the old Makarov. Why you guys? Makarov looked shocked, and looked to see Itachi eyeing the palace in the distance. Itachi. Welcome back, Makarov, let's get out of here quickly. Itachi smiled at the old master. Sasori said they will await us at the rendezvous point by the shore. Itachi made his way to a magic mobile park between the trees. Wait, Zirf, Zirf is here, he is, Makarov was about to warn them, but to his surprise he wasn't met with shock. We already know, one of the twelve told us. Lucy despite the situation smiled at Makarov along with Levy, looking understanding. Mest briefed us on the rest. I was so naive, those bastards never had the intention of negotiating. I sullied the reputation of my guild to come here, and in the end, it was all for naught. I've never been so ashamed. Makarov wept manly tears, feeling like a father having failed his children. It wasn't for nothing, Levy protested. We've all grown over this past year. And we all managed to rebuild the guild in the end too. Lucy joined Levy in comforting the broken old Makarov. Doing things for the sake of others are never meaningless. Now, let's go home, your family is waiting for you. Itachi stretched his hand out to the old master, standing like a strong pillar to carry the guild on into the future. Makarov wept more, as he grabbed onto Itachi's hand and stood with his children. Okay, we have to hurry, with my remaining power I can only teleport all of us one more time. And I would like to save it to get us to where Sasori and Serrano's boat awaits us. First, we need to get within range for my teleportation, so let's get moving. Mest was about to also board the magic mobile they had used to reach the border of the capital. Although the magic mobile was suddenly sunken into the sandy ground beneath it. Itachi and Mest both backed up in shock, as an almost equal pressure of power like the one they felt from Brandish surrounded them. Aw oh man, we were just getting to know each other. Leaving already, Makarov, we didn't even solve our little argument back there because of his majesty. Walking out from in between the trees, was a Ajeel from the Spriggan 12. Had enough times to buy gifts. Souvenirs, perhaps, you'll be six feet under before you know it. Ajeel. Makarov had cold sweat running down his old wrinkly face. Impossible. How did he get here? Mest looked in equal fear as Makarov. Sand. Sand's awesome. It tells me, everything. Ajeel cackled as sand ran down from his hand like water. Everyone looked on alert, and ready to fight their way out. Stop, he is not someone we can defeat. Our only option is to run away. Makarov warned, yet Itachi merely rushed Ajil much to the Desert King's shock. Ajil was unable to react in time, as Itachi elbowed Ajil right in the face knocking him back a few meters. Ajil crashed into a tree, although it didn't break, instead it turned to sand and fell apart. Blood dripped from Ajil's broken nose, he looked shocked as he held his hand to his nose, blood dripping onto the palm of his hand. Ajil grew a wide smirk, grinning from ear to ear, laughing like a maniac. That strike, held some weight behind it. Ajil looked at Itachi, amused and beyond excited. Sweet, sweet. So, this is one of Makarov's soldiers. Should have expected as much from his majesty's own creation. Kick his ass Itachi. Levy cheered. Go for its seventh master. Lucy cheered with Levy. Seventh. Makarov was brought out from his shock of seeing Itachi easily injuring Ajil. I see. So Itachi has taken my place. Makarov despite the situation, cracked a fatherly smile. Fantastic, I knew he was perfect for the job. Makarov looked beyond proud. Sweet, sweet, how sweet. Ajil cackled, if all you can do is annoy me, then you will find yourself dead before you know it. Itachi glared at Ajil, killer intent leaking out from him. Before any fight could take place, Makarov turned into a giant, and snatched up his children into his arms and started running. Itachi was the only one Makarov didn't pick up, knowing one of his most trusted children could keep Ajil occupied and even defeat him if possible. Ajil, like Brandish did, didn't look Itachi directly in the eyes. Seems Madera's encounter with the Alvarez Empire left an impression on the Twelve. 
which made things troublesome for Itachi, yet not by that much. Itachi generated volts of electricity around his body, gathering them all around his hand to the shape of a blade. Chidori Itachi charged at lightning speed, dragging the lightning across the ground tearing it up, right when he was standing in front of Ajil, he dragged his hand up and swung the lightning blade towards Ajil. Ajil responded by generating a wall of sand around him, yet the lightning pierced through with ease and sliced Ajil across the chest. The lightning generated through the grains of sand surrounding Ajil, tearing it down. The first thing Ajil saw as the sand wall came down, was a massive blazing ball of fire crashing into him. Itachi looked at Ajil getting pushed back by his fireball for a moment, before quickly following after Makarov and the rest. Ajil was unable to hold the fireball back. Ajil grunted, the flames of the fireball tickling against his skin as he was sent flying like a rocket. Ajil began cackling as with the fireball he crashed into the ocean, water sprouting up like a geyser as the fireball blew up. Ajil was washed up to shore, having suffered minor burns and smoke emitting from his body. Bastard, Ajil smirked as he cackled. Wonderful. Ajil gathered the sand from the beach around him, into a gigantic sand monster and took chase after Makarov and the rescue team. Itachi jumped from tree branch to tree branch at full speed, until Makarov's fleeing giant figure came into view. Itachi, did you deal with Ajil? Makarov didn't stop running at full speed for even a moment, not until they had reached the safe zone. Gently he held Lucy, Levy and Mest inside of his giant palms. I think I held him back for a bit. But we need to hurry. Itachi replied as he took a giant leap towards Makarov, taking a flip and landing on his feet on Makarov's giant shoulder. We should. Itachi halted from speaking, as he heard the running sand, and rumbling coming behind them. Ah, uh, he's coming. Makarov widened his eyes seeing a giant shadow rising over him. Best not to look behind master, just focus on running. Itachi sweated a bit, seeing a giant sand tsunami of a monster behind them, with Ajil standing on top. Leaving so soon, Ajil smirked down on Itachi, raising his arms. And as if mimicking his movements, the sand monster raised its massive arms to smack Makarov down. The massive sand monster didn't seem to intimidate Itachi, judging by his lack of reaction. That careless look on his face, which resembled the look of arrogance infuriated Ajil. Even more as Itachi responded by forming a set of hand seals at lightning speed. Water style. Explosive water shockwave. Itachi leaned backwards, his chest expanding and his cheeks looking full. Then with a heave, Itachi spewed out a massive amount of raging water. The water growing into a massive tsunami wave to counter the sand. Ajil looked shocked, at how much water Itachi summoned forth despite them not being near the ocean. The water clashed with the sand, moistening Ajil's sand monster. Ajil gaped as his sand monster crumbled and he fell down with it. Freakin' sweet. Ajil chuckled as he merged with the sand beneath him. Watch it, he can assimilate into the sand. Makarov warned. Roger, Itachi kept a close eye on the ground beneath them, noticing it sinking in. Master, halt, Itachi ordered and Makarov stopped in his tracks, seeing his feet beginning to sink into the sand. The sand latching onto his ankles. Ugh, and lion pit, Ajil formed out from the sand, watching from a safe distance as Makarov was sinking with his children. Do you know how many people I have killed? How many towns I have swallowed whole? Ajil smirked down on them, looking confident. This ant lion pit leads straight to hell. None have escaped its clutches. Despite the situation, Itachi's expression didn't change. Lucy, Levy and Mest who climbed onto Makarov's shoulders looked distressed. But Ajil only focused on Itachi, and grew annoyed that he didn't seem to despair. Hey maggot, don't you understand? You are going to die. Ajil grew more annoyed, as Itachi's expression still didn't change. He looked unimpressed, and Ajil taking it as an insult had veins bulging around his temples. Why won't you despair? Despair, overplaying in a little sandbox. You are going to have to do better than that to impress me. Itachi crossed his arms, and stared back at Ajil, who now was beyond pissed off, he was one of the mighty Spriggan 12. 12 mages handpicked by the Emperor himself as the 12 strongest mages in the world, sink, sink to hell, Ajil roared, speeding up the sinking process of the sand pit. Makarov, get ready, Itachi had his Mangeku Sharingan spinning, and suddenly a gentle orange flame wrapped itself around Makarov's giant body. Cloaking Makarov, and the entire rescue team, the flames beginning to take shape of armor, cloaking Makarov in the armor of the perfect Suzano. 
and with the armor, follow the angelic-like wings of the perfect Suzano. Itachi, Makarov sounded a bit nervous. Let's fly, Itachi smiled, and without any control of Makarov they all took flight out of the sand pit. Ajil quickly tried to have his sand stretch out and grab them, but the moment the sand came in contact with the armor of the Suzano, it dispersed. Impossible, he escaped the pit, even mages capable of flight have never escaped before. Yet he, Ajil balled his hands into fists, and grew a wicked smirk across his lips. Sweet, fucking sweet, guess you aren't just all talk. Finally, a real challenge. If only I could say the same, Itachi retorted back at Ajil. He had no time to deal with this battle-hungry moron. He wanted to hurry back home, to his guild, to his fiancé. As Itachi prepared for a counter-attack to end this skirmish, he could feel a vibration in his pocket. He brought out a lacrima that Sasori gave him in case of emergencies and any problems with plotting their escape. What's wrong? Bad news, you need to find a new ride home. Sasori's grunting voice was heard from the other end, along with the sound of explosions in the background and the tremors that followed. We've been compromised, me and Serrano need to leave now. I understand, Itachi knew all too well that this kind of situation was to be expected on an infiltration mission. And now he needed to think of a backup plan. He could always use his perfect Suzano to fly them all back home. But the problem was he didn't have enough chakra to make the trip, unless he would risk tapping into E's power. Seems my colleague Walido found your ride hidden under the ocean. Ajil cackled as with his sand he created a massive sand tsunami, towering over Itachi's airborne perfect Suzano casting an ominous shadow over them. Guess I have no choice, Itachi flies the Suzano down, uncloaking Makarov by deactivating the Suzano. My boy, what are you doing? Makarov questioned fearfully, wondering if Itachi had given up. Messed, Lucy and Levy peeked out from in between Makarov's giant hands looking worried. Protecting my family. Itachi replies, an aura of darkness beginning to emit from him. The air around them turned cold as ice, the wind itself shifted direction blowing in towards Itachi like it was being pulled in. Ah, Itachi, wait, Lucy tried to stop him, all of them remembering what happened during Tartaros and witnessing E firsthand. There is nothing to worry about, I have gained some control over this power. Itachi focused his mind on positive thoughts, such as when he proposed to Mira Jane. The most recent very positive moment of his life. It wasn't enough to tame the full power of E, but enough to use some it without perhaps losing his emotions. Ah, that reminds me, Master Makarov. Itachi looked to the confused concerned looking Makarov, and smiled happily. A few days ago, I proposed to Mira Jane. We're getting married, and I really hoped, you would wed us. As a wizard saint, you should be able to hold the ceremony for us. Makarov was at a loss for words, he couldn't help but feel happy. What is more, the confidence in Itachi's words, and his look of confidence and certainty truly made Makarov believe they would get out of this alive. Like you even need to ask. As a parent, I can't help but feel joy over my children having found happiness. Just expect, that this old man will get emotional. Makarov gave a fatherly like grin. Too bad this is where it ends for you. Ajil interrupted the moment, his sandstorm tsunami closing in. Game over, Itachi was about to explode with his power of darkness, although halted. His eyes widened a bit, looking like he got an unexpected surprise. Itachi's dark aura vanished, his lips twisting up into a tiny smirk. Huh, Ajil raised his brow at seeing Itachi's smirk, and before he even could ask the question. The answer came down in the form of a lightning bolt raining down from the sky. The violent roaring lightning blasting straight through and dividing Ajil's sand tsunami. Hovering in the air above them, was a ship. A flying ship with wings. It was the treasure of the Blue Pegasus Guild, the magic bomber Christina. And standing on board, looking down on them with his arms crossed. Was Laxus, flickers of lightning sparking around his body as he glared down on Ajil. Laxus, Makarov was just as surprised as Ajil at the entrance of his grandson. He blew away the sandstorm with just one attack. Lucy and Levy looked in awe. That was awesome. The cheers of Natsu could be heard from the ship, seems Natsu and his team were successful in locating Laxus. Yo, I see a few more wrinkles on your forehead, Gramps. Laxus greeted his grandfather with a smirk. Everyone, get on board, we're falling back. Gray's voice was heard from the loudspeakers, shortly followed by Gajil. Jihi, this ship has been customized for use by Dragon Slayers. 
Salamander has been parading here ever since he noticed he didn't start blowing chunks. Kana's voice followed next. Man, Laxus sure knows me, he stocked the place full of booze. And what followed was the frantic voice of Ichia. Mean, that's from my own personal storage. Oi, Itachi, Laxus called out as he held Natsu back by an arm length distance. Mind explaining why Natsu and Gajil keep trying to fight me? Itachi averted his eyes with a slight sweat drop. Messed, teleport us on board. Itachi changed the subject, and messed without needing to hear anything else teleported them all on board Christina. Like I'd let you run. Ajil moved the sand, towards the ship to drag it down from the sky. Run, Laxus raised his lightning covered hand and glared down on Ajil. Fool, this is only the intermission. Laxus blasted away the incoming sand without any difficulty. From what I hear, Itachi is the new master, and the master, does not need to bother with small fries like you. Small fry, Ajil glares in anger with veins bulging around his temple, enraged at that comment. Let's go home guys, our dinner is getting cold. Laxus sends one final lightning bolt down on Ajil. The lightning exploding into a large dome of electricity, nearly reaching the magic bomber Christina. The Pegasus ship flying away into the distance. The smoke from Laxus attack cleared away, and revealed to be standing in a burning smoking crater, was Ajil. His body stunned from the lightning, lightning flickering around his immobile body. T that bastard, Ajil snickered, struggling to even move his fingertips. That threw me for a loop, Ajil struggled even turning his head, to greet a new figure. The barrier you put up barely held there, August. Ajil greeted the old wizard king. Figured you needed a dose of reality, Ajil. And realize, you are in fact not all powerful. August with a snap of his fingers, negated the lightning that surged through Ajil's body. Ajil cracked his sore neck, and rotated his shoulders. Oi, August, I know you didn't just call me weak. Ajil looked dangerously at the wizard king. Do I need to remind you who is the leader of the Spriggan 12? August narrowed his gaze slightly at Ajil, and just from that a ton of pressure filled the air. Ajil had a cold bead of sweat running down his forehead. Relax, old man, I didn't mean nothing by it. Ajil smirked. Come, the emperor has summoned everyone for a meeting. August turned around and walked away. But we can't just let them get away. Ajil pointed to the direction the magic bomber Christina vanished to. The emperor's orders are absolute. August turned down Ajil's suggestion. Ha, yeah right, like Irene is going to show up. Ajil snorted, knowing full well that the strongest woman of the Spriggan 12 did as she pleased most of the time. If Irene does not attend, she will have to deal with his majesty's wrath. Same goes for you, if you don't come. Ajil flinched a bit, realizing how serious the situation was. Ajil shrugged his shoulders and grumpily followed August. What about Walido? Did he manage to capture the spies? No, one of the spies was a creation of his majesty himself. He turned out to be more difficult to capture, and managed to avoid Walido's constant barrage of gunfire. To this Ajil sighed with a hint of relief, glad he wasn't the only one who messed up. The trip back to Ishgar, and Magnolia went rather quiet. Everyone rushed back to the guildhall, finding it standing tall at the edge of Magnolia like always. Having been fully rebuilt while Itachi and the gang were away on the rescue mission. And the moment they entered the guild, Natsu presented the slight embarrassed Makarov proudly by holding the dwarf old man high up into the air. And thus, everyone cheered at the official true revival of Fairy Tale. Raise your glasses, cheers, welcome home, master, Romeo greeted Makarov. Wait, Itachi is the master now, so, what do we call him? Macau looked to Wakaba. Makarov-san, Wakaba rubbed his chin, if you want, I can give you the title of master back. Itachi offered Makarov, but was meet with a heartful laughter from him. No way, I will enjoy my retirement. Makarov patted Itachi on the back. Besides, you are more than ready to hold the title of master. So, seventh master, what are your orders? Makarov warmly smiled at him, seeming like a huge burden had been lifted off his shoulders. Which made Itachi wonder all the more, just how much paperwork will he have to file? And how many apology letters would he have to start writing due to Natsu's destructive nature? Oh well, Itachi wasn't going to let such troublesome thoughts ruin his mood. My orders, Itachi hoped onto a table, grabbing a mug of ale much to everyone's surprise as Itachi wasn't the kind of man to drink alcohol. Break out the booze, and let's celebrate our guild's revival. Itachi chugged down the ale, and was met with cheer from the crowd. 
Long live the seventh master. Kana cheered grabbing a barrel of booze, and pulling Laxus in close, wrapping her available arm around his shoulder. And let's celebrate the return of Laxus, the Thunder God tribe, and the third, sixth master. Laxus looked slightly awkward at Kana holding him so close. Laxus. Freed freaked out a bit at seeing Kana so close to Laxus. You know, I've never seen him like this. Bixlo commented, looking a bit surprised at seeing Laxus act this awkward. Could it be because they have known each other for a long time? I mean, Kana joined the guild before any of us did. Bixlo looked between Freed, who was weeping a bit, and Evergreen who merely shook her head at them. It's obvious that he likes her. Evergreen sighed, muttering under her breath. So, what's the deal with you being in Blue Pegasus? Kana asked, a smug grin spread across her face as she drank with Laxus. Laxus gave light coughs, and hid his flustered face. Stop it, Laxus muttered under his breath, and Kana just giggled. Ho, oh, Kana looked smugly, and then called for Evergreen. Yo, Ever, tell me how was Laxus as a host? Evergreen straight away went like an excited schoolgirl over to Kana to gossip. Oh, you have no idea, he would usually just be a grouch in the corner. But what is funny, when he actually tried. Not another word, woman, Laxus glared at Evergreen. And the two ladies just giggled, much to Laxus' dismay. The celebration went on, the guild being as rowdy as ever. Drinking, brawling, and the occasional table being flung into the air. The party was interrupted by none other than Makarov, tapping a staff onto the floorboard. The staff looked to be made out of food, and at the top was a carved fairy tale emblem. Everyone, forgive me, I won't make any excuses the one who destroyed the place you all call home was me. I am truly sorry, Makarov lowered his head apologetically. That is also why I won't take back the title of master, when I failed you all so miserably. Makarov nudged for Itachi to come closer. Itachi excused himself from Myra's side, and walked up to the stage to Makarov. Makarov held his staff, and handed it over to Itachi. This staff, is made from a tree on Tenro Island. My father, Yuri Dreyar intended to make this for the first master, Mavis as a gift. Although, he never got the chance to give it to her, and so, it was given to Master Prek when he became the second master. And he, gave it to me. Now, it is yours. Itachi looked a bit overwhelmed, feeling like he was accepting a great deal of responsibility. Itachi hesitantly took the staff out from Makarov's hands. Master I, just Makarov will do, my boy. After all, you are the master now. Makarov put his hands over Itachi's, as he handed over the staff to him. I know you will succeed where I could not. I have faith that you will lead these kids into a bright future. I know you will be a great father. Makarov then stepped down from the stage, and walked amongst the crowd, just an average member of the guild now. Everyone fell in silence, and looked towards the stage where Itachi stood also in silence. Itachi gripped the staff tightly, and tapped it on the floorboard, making a large thud echo noise. The Alvarez Empire, a grand empire built up out of hundreds of magic guilds. Guilds that heavily outnumber the ones in Ishgar alone. What is more, its emperor is the immortal black wizard Zirf himself. This foe, is something one can describe with only one word, unbeatable. Itachi's words shifted the festive mood into a dire one. However, that is what they said about the Grimoire Heart, Tartaros, and we defeat them all. We have accomplished the impossible before. We will do it again. We have to stand up and fight. Hell yeah, let's crack some skulls. Natsu roared from within the crowd. Lucy elbowed Natsu slightly, telling him to stay quiet as Itachi hadn't finished his speech yet. I can make you promises that we will win, I can promise that we'll all be fine. I can promise we'll all drink together like this again. But I won't, because I won't lie to you. This won't be like any of the battles we have had before, this won't be just us fighting against a dark guild, this is nation against nation. A full-scale war, and in war, there are casualties, I speak from experience. Some of us will not survive this battle. The enemy will come at you with the intent to kill, so I expect all of you to do the same. Everyone looked amongst each other, nervous whispers heard amongst them. If there are those amongst you, who wishes to flee and not participate in the war. I will understand, I'm not going to force anyone into battle. Like there is anything to think about. Natsu erupted from the crowd, a wide grin spread across his face. We're family, we stick together, and we fight together. I'm in, I will fight. Gray stood up with Natsu. I have no intention of backing out. Urza declared proudly. 
like you even need to ask, Laxus followed up, and shortly everyone stood tall together. But hidden in the background, was Mira, she looked quite nervous. Gently rubbing her own belly, looking concerned. She swallowed this nervous lump in her throat, and stepped forwards. We will fight, as a family, Mira declared, and everyone erupted into cheer. Family. Seems we've all made our peace with the upcoming war. Makarov hummed, I'm with everyone, let's make those that stand against our family rue the day they were born. Then it is decided, we'll fight for our guild's survival. Itachi smiled upon them all. It was hard to believe, that after all this he would never see some of them again. Before the battle however, there is something we must discuss. Makarov interjected, Lumen Histoire, or more accurately Fairy Heart. Allow me to tackle that topic, 6th. Appearing out of nowhere, like an actual ghost was the spiritual projection of Mavis Vermilion. First, Makarov respectfully nodded, and Itachi stepped aside to let the first master speak her mind. Everyone, Fairy Heart has been treated as the ultimate secret of this guild. A secret that must never be revealed to the world, but because of the upcoming war, all of you deserve to know the reason why Zirf is after it. And you must know of my sin. To this everyone looked perplexed, what kind of sin was she talking about? The time has finally come for me to tell you all. A story of a cursed boy and a cursed girl. And the story of the magic they both sought. The story Mavis told them, took place during the second trade war. And how events prior to it, carried heavy consequences. She told them how she first met Warred, Precht and Yuri on Tenro Island. How they went in search of the Tenro Orb, and ended up in Magnolia. How they later met a young man, who turned out to be Zirf who taught this adventure group about magic. And how Mavis would later use a spell known as, Law, an unperfected version of today's, Fairy Law, and how she saved Magnolia and Makarov's father Yuri. But in return her body would never grow or age. That did not however turn out to be the case. As Mavis would learn when she encountered Zirf once more, and officially learned of his identity. And that's when Zirf told her, she had been cursed by the god of death, Anxarum. For using, law, incorrectly. Mavis however, refused to believe him, until on the faithful day, of Makarov's birth. Having witnessed, and learned just how truly cherished life is, the curse of contradiction was activated, and Mavis took the life of Makarov's mother Rita. And fled in terror, and as far away from the guild as possible so they wouldn't fall victim to her curse. She went on for days, months, years without food or water, yet she would not die. She found herself unable to even sleep or rest. Then Zirf found her again. And they connected, sharing the pain of the curse of contradiction. Dreaming of the sweet release of death, but death would never come for the cursed couple. Zirf and Mavis, found themselves to be the only ones to understand one another. They could have a life together for the rest of their eternal lives, until the end of time. Yet, Fate was not so kind. For it turns out, other than demons there was one way for one cursed by Anxarum to die. And that was from a fellow cursed human. Well, in a sense to be killed. The curse of contradiction, the more you love the more life you take. And Zirf having been alone for far longer than Mavis, felt more love in his lonely heart for her than she did for him. And thus, she ended up dying after they shared a moment on intimacy. Zirf broken, and devoid of any compassion, brought Mavis's body to Precht. And thus, Precht learned of Zeref's existence as well. Precht however, was able to feel the magic still living within Mavis. Even though she had no heartbeat or pulse. To save her life, Precht quickly sealed Mavis's body inside of a lacrima, to preserve her body. Yet every attempt of waking her up failed. It didn't take long for Precht to discover the root of the problem, Mavis's curse. And came to the conclusion Mavis was the one who took Rita's life. So, Precht kept it a secret from everyone. Not wanting to sully Mavis's name for the guild, he officially announced her dead, and told them he had made a grave for her on the guild's sacred ground, Tenro Island. Yet Precht continued trying to revive Mavis in secret, he had managed to restore life to her body. Although out of fear for the curse of Anxarum, he kept her sealed in the lacrima until it could be removed somehow. Years went by, and Yuri passed away on a mission, unaware of the truth behind his wife's death. Somewhere along all the testing and research, the magic in Mavis's body never stopped growing. Combining with her semi-permanent life force preservation ability, her immortal agelessness. All these things mixed with the ever-growing supply of Ethernano. Gave birth to a magic beyond explanation. Eternal magic, fairy heart. 
Mavis finished her tale, and everyone was left speechless. An endless font of magic power. An example might help, all of you are familiar with the council's Ethereum weapon. A super magic capable of erasing an entire country in one shot. With fairy heart, one could fire infinite Ethereum blasts. Such is the meaning of infinite, essentially this magic has the ability to destroy the entire world. Such a power would shake the world to the core. Fear and chaos would ensue if such knowledge became public. Despite it only being a projection, Itachi could see a lot of magic power coming from Mavis. As if this was her actual body almost. And he remembered what he saw when Mest showed him fairy heart. Truly, it was an endless void of magic power. And he had a pretty good idea why the Alvarez Empire would want such a weapon. I assume it is not for conquering the world. Despite the stories and rumors, Zirf isn't the type of person to have such an agenda. That seems more like a Madara thing to do if you ask me. Correct, I believe he wishes to use it to defeat Acknologia. Although as for this Madara, his intentions remain unclear to me. Mavis agreed, and began pondering why Madara would want it. Like Itachi said, it could be to take over the world and force peace. I don't think he actually wants to use it for such a purpose either. When I met him, I got the feeling he was after something completely different. Besides, with his powers it wouldn't be hard for him to take over the world by force. He would have no need for Fairy Heart to do that. Itachi spoke up. Um, can I say something? Gray raised his hand earning everyone's attention. I'm not sure how many knows this, but apparently my deceased master, Ur and Madara were lovers at one point. This made quite a few people who were unaware to gossip around the guild. But anyway, Ur never told me or Leon much about her past life. We only know she had a lover, and he impregnated her and vanished soon after. But, she told me, that she was certain he truly loved her. Despite what happened in the end, considering we found out he is a demon of the Book of Zirf recently, I thought, maybe he did have a good reason to leave after all. And so, I have been thinking, is it possible he is after Fairy Heart to use its infinite magic power to somehow revive her? Perhaps, although he already has the ability to revive the dead. Itachi replied, earning some shocked glances as they all waited for him to explain in greater detail. Itachi activated his Sharingan, which morphed into the Mangekyu and again into the Rinnegan. These eyes, are known as the Rinnegan. They are the eyes a god-like figure in my world used to possess. Madara has these very same eyes. As do I, thanks to Zirf. Those eyes can revive the dead? Makarov questioned. Yes, although it has its own conditions. The Rinnegan grants one all the abilities of the Sage of the Six Paths. One of those abilities is known as Rene Rebirth. It can revive a single person who has been dead for a very long time. Or it can revive multiple people who have died recently within the past 24 hours. Itachi explained the nature of the Rene Rebirth, he didn't know much about it, only what Nagato told him back when they were reanimated during the Fourth Great Ninja War, and they both shared stories on how they died. Then what was all the talk about some of us dying earlier? If you have those eyes you can just revive us if we all die. Macau seemed confident that they now could win this war without any trouble. The same could be said for everyone who seemed in high spirits. I cannot, Itachi replied to which everyone once again went silent. There is a consequence for using Rene Rebirth. No matter the user, once you have used Rene Rebirth, the caster will die as a result. It involves one exchanging their life for the life of others. And thus, the mood turned awkward, no one exactly could ask Itachi to give his life for theirs. Just like he couldn't ask the same of them. It's not that I wouldn't give up my life for all of you. I gladly would, I don't hold my life in higher value than any of yours. It's just, I've never had a reason to stay alive before. Now I feel like I do, Itachi cast a look to Mira Jane amongst the crowd, going unnoticed by almost everyone. Gray decided to change the subject. So, is Madara maybe trying to get the fairy heart so he doesn't die? I mean if he had infinite magic power, maybe he would survive. No, fairy heart is entirely made up out of ether nanoparticles. In order to cast the Rene rebirth it requires chakra. An infinite ethernano, is not the same as chakra. Itachi replied. So, we're back to square one, Gray uttered as they couldn't for the life of them figure out what Madara was planning. Hey, can't we use fairy heart to blow away the Alvarez Empire, Acnologi on Madara? Happy eagerly asked. That is an option, however, to unleash fairy heart in such a manner is certain doom. 
even I am unable to control it completely, we would risk having Ethereum blasts raining down on Earthland on a daily basis. Mavis shut down Happy's suggestion, several had shivers running down their spine over such a horrifying thought. Doesn't matter, we're not handing over the first body. Yeah, we won't let those Alvarez creeps near you. Everyone went in high spirits, fully backing up the founding master of their home. Who would think that a magic born of my sins, would put all of you in such peril? Mavis looked down, ashamed over having put her comrades in such a situation. It ain't no sin to fall in love with someone. Gajil unexpectedly declared, earning some shocked gasps from the crowd. Levy blushed a bit at Gajil's declaration. I agree. Itachi smiled in agreement to Gajil's words. Falling in love isn't a sin. Itachi infused his hand with spiritual Suzano energy to be able to touch Mavis and comforting patting her head. First, please do not blame yourself. Urza spoke up from the crowd. Yes, this is just the result of a series of unfortunate events. Mira Jane looked sympathetic for Mavis. If it weren't for you, there'd be no fairy tale. Lucis' declaration was met with hums of agreement from everyone. Ironically, Zirf is also responsible for fairy tale existing today, Itachi muttered to himself. You're the person that brought all of us together. Gray's declaration, along with the support of everyone made Mavis's eyes watery. We want to protect the guild that you created. That's why we fight, Wendy declared, and thus, the tears ran down Mavis's joyous smiling face. Speaking of tears, the romantic Juvia couldn't help but let her tears flow as well. And Gray quickly tried to comfort her and ask what was wrong. Mavis Sama is going to have to fight the person she once loved, isn't she? Mavis fell in silence. Our love is a thing of the past. Zirf is now a threat to humanity. We must defeat him at any and all cost. Everyone seemed to accept Mavis's declaration, yet some like Itachi, Mira Jane, Urza, and Makarov couldn't help but notice that a part of Mavis didn't believe in her own words. Clearly, she still had feelings for the Black Wizard. But hey, how are we going to defeat someone that is immortal? Bixlow asked all of a sudden. Indeed, maybe we could seal him. Freed suggested. I will take care of Zirf. Itachi and Natsu spoke up at the same time. Hey, Itachi, I mean it I will defeat Zirf. Natsu declared flashing his right arm that was wrapped up in a white cloth. I got a secret weapon. Natsu, may I ask, why do you want to defeat Zirf? Itachi asked, wondering why Natsu seemed so eager to fight Zirf. It couldn't be just to test his powers, could it? Huh, well, cause he's the enemy. Besides, Ever since I first saw him, I've been dying to take him down. Natsu declared. Makarov remained silent, deep in thought as he recalled what Zirf told him, before Makarov was rescued by Mest. Natsu, are you really Zeref's brother? Odd, Itachi couldn't help but find Natsu's declaration to be kind of strange. When Natsu first met Zirf they were just strangers, Natsu shouldn't have any desire to beat up a stranger for no reason. Regardless, I should be the one to kill Zirf. Itachi declared. Why, Natsu asked, looking a bit annoyed actually. I am an Aetherius demon, Zirf altered my body for the sole purpose of killing him. He even said to himself, that only a demon can harm or kill an immortal. So, I should be the one. Itachi's explanation made several other shrugs in agreement, yet Natsu didn't seem pleased. No, I gotta be the one. Let me fight him, I have to, I don't know why, but, I just do okay. Natsu grabbed onto Itachi's collar. Clearly having a strong urge to kill Zirf, Natsu was beyond reasoning with. Alright, then how about this? Whoever first reaches Zirf, gets the right to defeat him, Itachi suggested, wanting to just end this discussion without too much drama. Enengish, okay, fine, game on, I will cream Zirf before you even see his face. Natsu cheerfully declared. Fantastic, and now, Urza suddenly grabbed Itachi and pushed him out of the guild, tossing a tuxedo out after him. Itachi stood there perplexed as he held the tuxedo in his arms. All boys out, all the girls joined hands in pushing out every single male member of the guild. All the boys looked dumbfounded, and blinked their eyes repeatedly in confusion as Urza slammed the doors in their faces. Hey what the hell, Gray shouted as he and several of the boys started banging on the door, demanding to be let back in. Then suddenly multiple swords stabbed out from the other end of the door, making the boys back away in terror knowing Urza was behind it. We're preparing things for the wedding. Mira Jane is going to change into her wedding dress, so all boys stay out. 
and we can't have any of you ruffians mess anything up. Just stay out there and wait until I call you all back inside. Urza shouted from the other end. And so, all the boys looked to Itachi who was holding a tuxedo, looking just as confused as the rest. W wait we're doing the wedding now. Itachi blinked looking surprised. Ha ha ha. Makarov gave a heartwarming laughter. Your freedom will be gone forever after tonight, my boy. Oh oi, remember. If you make Nei chan cry, I will pummel you into the dirt. Elfman shouted as almost every one of the guys surrounded Itachi. Ah, man, we didn't even get to throw you a bachelor party, Laxus teased Itachi a bit, putting his arm around his rival's shoulder. But seriously, why now? Gray asked, because, this might be the only chance we get. Makarov replied, taking a seat on the edge of the sidewalk chugging down a mug of ale. With the war coming, there is no telling if all of us, if not any of us are breathing. So, we might as well throw one hell of a wedding and party afterwards to celebrate like we've never done before. I I'm supposed to wear this at the wedding. Itachi looked at his tuxedo, having expected something more like the wedding traditions back home. Uh, guys, how do weddings like this usually go in this world? To everyone's surprise, Itachi actually looked a bit flustered. What, they're different in yours? Elfman asked and Itachi just nodded. Leave this to me fellas. Alzac proudly took this moment to serve as a kind of mentor to Itachi. Being that I'm a married man, I can tell you all about our world's traditions. Well, so can I, Wakaba uttered. Although I would probably focus on the nightmare which became my life after the honeymoon, Wakaba paled. Ah, come on, we all know you love your wife. Macau teased his best friend. Yeah, yeah, Wakaba chuckled. So, Itachi, nervous, Makarov looked like he was having the time of his life, same with the rest of them as they saw Itachi like this. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I would feel less nervous facing Madara, Aknilo beyond the Alvarez Empire at the same time. Itachi had a bit of a cold sweat running down his neck. Makarov comforted him by patting his back. That's just cold feet, it's perfectly normal. Although once you see her in that dress, you will know you are doing the right thing. Makarov's comforting words eased Itachi's heart a bit. Unbeknownst to Itachi, Mira Jane was just as nervous as he was. My, this is all, rather sudden, Mira sweated nervously as the girls helped her get ready. It's okay Mira Nay, you know deep down in your heart that you are doing the right thing. I mean, you do love Itachi, don't you? Lizana teased her sister a bit, as she helped her fit into her wedding dress. I do, it's just, well, Mira looked like she was about to freak out bringing her hand to her stomach area. Mira Ney, is there something you haven't told me? Lizana gently put her hands onto her big sister's shoulders and looked her in the eye. Something you haven't maybe even told Itachi. I don't want to burden him even more. With this war, the stress he must be having to protect everyone, I can't drop this on him, not now. Without the need to say explicitly what it was, Lizana understood right away what Mira Jane was talking about. The guild needs him. They need him to stay focused. Mira Ney, Lizana cupped her hands around Myris, and smiled comfortingly at her older sister. There might not be another time to tell him. Lizana, I'm honestly terrified. Myris' eyes grew watery. What if he dies? What if you die? What if Elfman dies? What if all of us dies? What if? Mira struggled to hold back her tears, and whimpered. What if? What if my baby dies? Or what if? Itachi is the only one left and uses that Rene rebirth to bring everyone back, and our baby would have to grow up without ever knowing their father. Lizana warmly embraced her sister in a hug, letting Mira cry her heart out into Lizana's shoulder. It's going to be alright, we'll survive, fairy tale will survive. Lizana comforted. Please, don't tell him, Mira nay. Lizana, promise me, please don't tell Itachi that I'm pregnant. Mira practically begged. Only if you promise me, that you will tell him yourself. Lizana knew her big sis was scared, terrified, but even so. Lizana also knew Mira needed to tell Itachi. Lizana, I, either you tell him, or I will. Lizana hated that she had to sound so cruel to her dearest older sister. I promise, Mira whimpered, and Lizana smiled breaking the hug. Lizana took a handkerchief and wiped Mira's tears away. Thank you. Don't mention it, Mira nay. Now, let's get you ready for your big day. Lizana flashed a bright smile to her sister, and Mira smiled back and kissed her little sister on the forehead. Little by little, 
the girls called and the guys, until Itachi was the last one left outside. Finally, Urza called him in. You look really handsome in that, Oni-san. Urza straightened his tie, she was dressed in a violet low-cut dress decorated with red rose patterns. Thank you, I suppose. Itachi found himself looking rather awkward in this tuxedo. He walked into the guild hall, and found it decorated with white banners, flowers decorated around the pillars of the guild, and the railings of the second and third floor. A wedding cake in the corner of the guild with a buffet, and curtsy of Kana a lot of booze. And with curtsy of grey there were ice decorations of fairy tale symbols decorated around the guild, and an ice sculpture of Itachi and Mira Jane embraced into each other's arms. And a red carpet leading straight to the stage in the center of the guild, where Makarava waited standing on a few boxes dressed in a suit. It looked like a rather simple wedding. Itachi walked onto the stage, as he had heard from the guys. Seeing Laxus serving as his best man, and Urza as maid of honor. Itachi was so nervous, he could hear his heart beating. Are you ready? Laxus nudged at him. I think so, Itachi swallowed a nervous lump in his throat. W who's got the rings? Wendy and Romeo, Makarov replied, holding back his fatherly tears of joy. Suddenly music started playing, Grey having used his maker magic to make an ice piano. Itachi looked towards the walkway where he saw Romo and Wendy walking first with the rings, followed by the bridesmaids Urza, Lizana, Kana, Lucy, Juvia. And in the back was Mira Jane, and the moment he saw her the nervous feeling in him vanished. Itachi was at a loss for words, Mira was breathtaking. She was dressed in a beautiful white wedding dress, with white veils going over the back of her head, her bangs let down over her forehead, and in her hands, she held a small bouquet. What is for certain, seeing her like this, made Itachi know he was making the right decision. Mira Jane walked up onto the stage, and stood next to Itachi. Both looking into each other's eyes, all their worries and cares washing away. As they only focused on each other. D dearly beloved, Makarov sniffed, heartwarmingly tears running down his face. Makarov continued the speech, with the guild in high spirits overseeing the union between Itachi and Mira Jane. With even the spirit of Mavis watching from the back, smiling heartwarmingly as she was reminded of Yuri and Rita's wedding. The couple both exchanged their vows, promising each other to love and cherish each other even during sickness and in health. Romeo and Wendy handed them their rings, Itachi puts the wedding ring onto Mira Jane's ring finger, and she puts the ring on Itachi's ring finger. Now, Makarov was about to continue, although Mira halted him. Wait, I have something for you. Mira Jane took out a small box hidden within her bouquet. Mira opened the box and what she presented Itachi, left him awestruck. In the box, laid a ninja headband identical to the one he used to have. With the hidden leaf insignia on it without the nasty cut carved over it. I had the blacksmith make it for you. Mira Jane awaited Itachi's response, her face a little flustered. Figured you would want some motivational power from your home, to protect your new home. Mira Jane grabs onto Itachi's right hand, looking at his fairy tale guild mark. Itachi smiles with nostalgia, remembering when he first graduated the academy. And how proud his parents were when he came home wearing the headband. Itachi's eyes became a bit watery. Thank you, I love it. Itachi accepted the headband, and put it on. Makarov smiled heartwarmingly, truly able to see the love between these youngsters. Do you, Itachi Uchiha, take Mira Jane Strauss to be your beloved wife? I do, and do you, Mira Jane Strauss, take Itachi Uchiha to be your devoted husband? I do, the couple held hands, looking deep into each other's eyes lovingly. With the power bestowed upon me, from the magic council as a wizard saint. I hereby declare you, husband and wife, you may kiss the bride. Mira Jane gently wrapped her hands around Itachi's neck, and Itachi held his hands around Mira Jane's waist. Itachi pulled Mira Jane into a hot passionate kiss, as they were now officially husband and wife. And with their kiss, the entire guild erupted into cheers. And instantly they broke out the booze. Now, let's party, Makarov declared, as the wedding reception began. While this joyous occasion was taking place, across the ocean on their neighboring nation, the enemy was plotting their next move. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. The next part will be out soon.